Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. Happy Friday. Happy cocktail night. It is good to see you. Our first ever, our first ever cross rug hooking crossword puzzle tonight. I called it, it sounds like such a boring name, but if it was the title of a book, I'm telling you it would be a bestseller. Rug Hooker's Puzzle. Aren't they always called something kind of like that? It's, I mean, it, it sounds very generic. Maybe I'll come up with a different name for the next one, but I had so much fun putting this crossword puzzle together. It was extremely um, um, labor intensive, <laughs> but it was so much fun. Um, hold on, I wanted to show you a few things. Let me make sure, yep, I got everything. I got everything about me. It was such a lot of fun. I hope you downloaded the puzzle and that you filled in as much as you could. It's a hard puzzle. I don't expect anybody uh, to have filled in all of it. And you know, if you looked up the answers and stuff, um, yeah, who cares, right? It's just for fun, just for fun. Um, so it's good to be able to, you know, I realized there were two things in the clues that were a little bit tricky. We'll, we'll get to them. Neither of them were incorrect. Um, but there was one word in the solutions that has two spellings, and I didn't think about that when I chose it. So I hope that didn't trip you up too much. Uh, the other one is just like a negligible, uh, small change, but we'll get to that in the content tonight. It's going to be fun to go over the clues together, isn't it? I am super excited. Happy Friday night. Cheers, my dears. Let's do this. This really was fun. You know, there are uh, crossword generators online. I did not know that. If you want to make them printable and stuff, you have to pay for certain versions, but there's tons of them out there. It's super fun to do with like colleagues and friends and family. Just send a puzzle every month or something, right? Mm. Let me change my glasses. Sauvignon Blanc. I'm right at the end of that bottle too, um, which is okay. I don't need to go nuts, do I? Whitney, do we work on it live? Oh, you can't retrieve it. I wonder why. Can anybody give Whitney help? Um, I saw a ton of people, a ton of people downloaded. So I'm so I'm so happy um, that you all have been working on it and stuff. Uh, Whitney, what what is it? Are you having trouble like printing it or downloading it or what part of it? Um, and you can work on it live or you can work on it like work ahead if you want, whatever you want. It's just for fun. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. Answer is it doesn't matter. It's just for fun. If you had time to work on it already, great. And we'll fill in the answers that you didn't get. And if you didn't, we'll just work on it together. It doesn't make any difference. I'm going to go over the entire puzzle. Melanie, good to see you in sunny, warm Western Washington iced tea tonight. Sounds refreshing. And, you know, I just spoke to Linda Ann in Canada. And we were talking, no, not Linda Ann, Kirsten. I spoke to Linda Ann much today, which I always do. I loved talking to my buddies. Um, Kirsten said that the air quality was worse here around New Haven than it was in Vermont. And she said she could see a real diff, you know, that there was a lot of smoke in the air. In other words, um, when she looked out at the big views of the mountains, see, I don't have that around New Haven. I don't have those big views. So, I mean, we just have the ocean here. So it's like when it's, when it's smoky, I'm thinking, well, it's summer. I expect it to be hazy. Um, cause I don't smell anything. I'm not detecting anything in the air, but apparently the air quality is quite bad right here, right now. Interesting. Cause somebody asked me, Linda, um, you might've asked me on, um, the thread that I, the little video that I did. And I said, no, oh, I think it was, I think it was Cynthia. Um, I said, no, I don't, it's, it's not, not at all for me, but it turns out it is quite bad here. <sighs> I didn't catch that and I didn't detect it myself. Linda H. Happy Friday from Massachusetts. April, great to see you in Illinois. You finally got your power back uh, on just an hour or so ago. It's been off for 27 hours. Oh my God. Many people are going to be out much longer. Oh God. Well, I'm so glad that you've got yours back. Um, very glad that you're there too. Hooray. Something else to celebrate on Friday, right? Oh man, that's a long time. Bonnie, ice water, lots of ice from Palm Coast, Florida. I bet it is warm. Linda B, cheers, my dear. So good. I know that's so good that her power is restored. That is a nightmare, right? It is like in theory, it's so romantic to have pioneer days, right? Sitting around all like Little House on the Prairie. Um, in fact, I was giving Jocelyn, I hope this isn't an insensitive thing to say. I was giving my daughter Jocelyn a bit of a hard time and I was kind of joking, joking around. But you know the show Wife Swap? Um, she, well, yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed that show back in the day. I definitely don't have time for that right now, although I enjoyed it immensely back in the day. Um, 
and Jocelyn was being like particularly just odious, just just like looking for trouble, you know, which she sometimes does because she's nine, right? So she's every right to not be on her game all of the time, and nobody's expecting her to. But I said to her um, something unhelpful, like, "Be careful, Jocelyn. I'm gonna um, submit your application for child swap," and she went nuts, like not in a funny way. She was so angry. And she said, well, where, where would I get sent? And I said, I, well, because she's on her phone all the time. I said, you probably get sent somewhere like Lancaster County. You might be wearing a, you know, a bonnet. Um, you'd probably be sitting by the fire, making the fire, cooking on the fire. Um, it, it's going to be rough. If you don't get your act together, it's going to be rough. As much as I love and admire the Amish, the Mennonites, and all of those communities, right? Um, on my way there, the month of solder. But uh, man, she did not like that prospect of that. What were those shows that used to be on where someone would go back in time to, for example, maybe not like an Amish village, right? Because that's like still current, but like, you know, Tudor England or like Little House on the Prairie, like, um, you know, homesteading kind of era of, of the US, like, you know, or like revolutionary or colonial era. What were those shows? Do they have a uniform name or were they different each time? Because I was trying to figure that out so I could pull them up on the compu on the TV. But you know how there's 450 different platforms. And unless you know what you're searching for by title, you're never going to Oh my God, I just got one of them. It was like 18 something house. Wasn't one of them called 18 something house? I wonder how fun those would be watch, uh, to watch now that I'm into older stuff. I'm going to get on with the show, but speaking of older stuff, because I know a lot of you are great connoisseurs of folk art, I just have to show you something that Jay found. Jay has an antique business and he shares the space with me. He found this today at, I don't know if I should say, at Goodwill. I said it, at Goodwill. And, and we are both, um, we're both collectors, so we have our, our flags up all the time for imposters and reproductions. This is not one. Look at this thing. It's an old trade board, right? Can you see this? It's a hand, and it's got pants, and it's got a deer under it. I mean, isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? And it seems to be a little bit of, he did a little bit of research on this already, um, for like uh, an outfitter, right? Like a, like an outfitter. It's old. It's got the square nails. It's got, um, it's got the kinds of board that you can see the two-person saw, right? It's not like the serrated sawtooth, but it's like you can see a two-person saw in these old nails. This is not from... Um, restoration hardware, right, or uh, home goods. It's it's like a really old trade sign. I probably shouldn't be fooling around with it, but I just thought, what a cool image, because um, I did that design light class that was, I'm being very careful here, I did that design light class designing like the tavern sign, right, and it kind of like we leaked over into trade signs looking at all kinds of signs like that from the days when people did not read and were not expected to read and may, if they did read it was just the Bible so why would you know why would they be like you know they wouldn't be they wouldn't be reading novels right so um, so you would have all these trade signs it's like I always go to this because I think it's a great example Ben Franklin's father was like um, he, he did soap he did wax he was like a, ch a kind of a chandler but not on a boat and all stuff with wax uh, with a tallow like foundation and um, his was the sign of the blue ball, different connotation now, but it was a, just a, this isn't going to sound right, but it was just a big blue ball like hanging in the center of Boston and people would know to go to the sign of the blue ball and they would go to Milk Street where he lived and look for it and if it was, and then they would know what that shop sold. But this is how these old trade signs work and I thought, what a great find that is. It was a good find. He had his eyes open today, man. Karen, good to see you. Tears, my dears, in Black Forest, Colorado. Dawn, great to see you from southeastern Michigan. Punching while you're working. <laughs> could you tell? Could you tell that was the tune to whistle while you work? Uh, Becky, great to see you. Evening iced tea uh, tonight. A lot of iced teas out there tonight. Cats Gallery. Cheers, my dears, in Southern California. If you say it, I've got to do it. Makes me think of my own cheers. This is a tiny little cup. I didn't realize I was so low. I, I was drinking out of it last week, too. So it's not at its best. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I never drink out of it during the week. It's just uh, many weeks old, I guess. Melissa, great to see you. Karen from Florida, great to see you. Spins a good yarn in western Pennsylvania. Great to see you. Welcome. 
Allie, good to see you. 98 degrees in Mississippi today. Heat index is in the hundreds. Oh my word. Hope you're sitting in front of a fan or an air conditioning unit or something. I did create tonight's puzzle on my own. I did, Linda. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I, it's it's a computer-generated thing. It's not like I figured it out, you know. I put all the words in. You put all the words in. You put all the clues in. And then you make the thing scramble. And it will automatically, It'll and it's a wonderful thing to see, right? It's all scrambling, and you can see the computer. You can see the computer working, all the words falling into different spots. And you're thinking like, whoa, did I do that? Did I do that? And, and then it settles, right? It's like done. and But then it shows you on the side, this area called scratch board, all of the words and clues that it couldn't fit. And at first I thought, man, look at it, it did it. And then I thought, oh my God, it left out half my clues. So I had to try a different program. But they're out there and they are a lot of fun. Linda Ann, cheers, my dears in Edmonton. Uh, Whitney, go to the link below this. Uh, it goes straight to it. Okay, excellent, thank you. Deborah, great to see you. Good evening. Paula, hello, y'all, from sunny California. Catherine, hello, in melting Missouri. Oh, man, I know. I'm so sorry. I hope that you're comfortable. I hope that you're comfortable. I know. It's like a joke, right? Are you laughing? Um, but I do. I hope that you're at least comfortable, if a little bit, you know, a little bit, because it's summer and it's rough. Robin, great to see you. Priscilla, great to see you in Akron, Ohio. Joyce, great to see you in Pennsylvania. And Van Stewart, hey, hey, uh, Kim, solo traveler and, and married traveler. Hello in Vancouver instead of Australia. Oh, you are on the move. You are traveling. <laughs> Good to see you, Catherine. All better now. Fantastic. Mom, you just popped on. Was that a neighborhood gathering? I had to write. You were in it. Were you at the con something in the condo association? I thought you hated all those people. None of them are on. None of them are on. I hope none of them are on. <laughs> I bet it was fun, though. Um, April. <laughs> Let me just catch up on the messages. Judy, great to see you. A trade board, Judy, is like when you would hang your sign out like that, right? So if we, we wouldn't have a rug hooking business in those days because they would be getting loom drugs as imports if, if they were getting anything. And, and just sweeping the dirt floor, that was like, that was it, right, in the very early days. But your trade board was like your, your shopkeeper sign. So it was like the sign you had outside that would let people know what you sold when they walked by or, you know, a lot of people traveling in those days. I think we forget that about like the colonial and settlement period of the U.S. People were on the move like crazy on these stagecoach routes that were the old Indian paths, the old Native American paths. Sorry. And people were on the move all the time. I mean, they, they were traveling all the time. It's like, I feel like we travel less now. When you look at the stats for how many people used to move their house, like in the 1800s versus now, it was way more people then. Because if you built it and you went through all that work, you would do anything you could to move that house rather than start again. And who are you gonna sell it to, right? Like how are you gonna find, everyone's like on the move all the time and it's all sparse, who are you gonna sell it to? You gotta move it if you plan to move. But it's amazing it, for, so many years ago, right, that whole period of history, so many years ago, so many things they they were so modern about. I think I always forget that. I always think that's uh, remarkable how much they had going on. It is a super treasure in advertise, advertising trade. Exactly. Exactly. Juliet, happy weekend. I've got to get that thing back to you. It has been nonstop. I finished um, the slideshow for tonight to accompany our solutions and I just had to drive here and get going at the studio. I had no no extra time at all today. Do you think maybe the deer skin gloves and britches? I do. I do think that's exactly what it is. Let me hold it up again. I do think it's deer skin gloves and breeches. Um, there's a little bit of paint on it so I won't touch the front. But yeah, I, I do. I think it's leather stuff. I think it's leather stuff um, and I'm guessing it is deer skin because there's a deer. And, and if it's from here, it's probably from New England, right? Because if it was out west, maybe it would be like a bear or a different animal. But there's lots of deer here. Oh, my gosh. You see them on the side of the road constantly. It's terrifying. But I think, I think, that's, a great, I think that's a great clue. I think you're onto something there. I think it must be that. That makes a lot of sense. It's just so nice to see that paint, you know, right on the plain board. And look at those old nails. Can you see the old nails? Let me show it to you a little closer up. I know this is exciting. It's so exciting to look at old things. I wish that you could smell it too. I had my face stuffed into the back of it where the wood meets with the nails. And it was like, ooh, wrinkle in time. 
It was like other times, other places, maybe other lives. It smelled so familiar, you know, so fun. Um, from Newfoundland. Diane, great to see you. Cheers, my dears, from Newfoundland and Labrador. Great to see you. Planning my trip up there in October. That was one of the things that we were working on this morning. Um, oh, God, it is smoky out there. The sun looks like it's totally hazed out. Okay, yeah. Uh, Kim says, I used to use these as a French teacher. Kids love them. What a great teaching aid. That is really smart and historic, right? Great t uh, hat tip to history. Uh, Hampton House. Yes, Allie, that's what I was thinking. Chrissy, good to see you in Georgia, my love. Great to see you. Graham, great to see you. Just tuned in. Finished a chair, paired la chair pad last night. Have a great weekend. Graham, great to see you. Congrats on that chair pad. Maybe send me an image of it so I can include it in, in our next gallery night. We can enjoy it together. We would love to see that chair pad. I bet it is a beauty. Uh, I'm catching up on the comments, Mom. Oh, that is nice. Judy, great to see you. Assume you have seen all the trade signs at the Connecticut Historical Society. I have. And that was in the video that I ran, actually. And for those of you who are interested in trade, trade signs, at least when I ran the class about two years ago, the Connecticut Historical Society, fantastic. They actually have, now I don't know what you'd call this, maybe like a 3D app or widget or something. Um, but you can go into the exhibit and you can turn and look at any piece on any of the any of the walls, right? It's in a regular shaped room and you can hone right in on it like you're standing there. You can hone right in on it and you can even look at the plaque and see whatever they know about the piece is on the plaque, right? So you can actually walk like we did that in class during the break i said you can either you know maybe have a restroom break or whatever a refreshment break but during that time i kind of walked through the exhibit and looked at the different pieces it's a lot that were there with the plaques thank you judy for reminding us that's something fun to do over the weekend if you are feeling it that is something fun to do let's get going with our puzzle i have a lot of images to show you today it's a lot it is going to be a fun night Good luck with your crossword puzzles. Let me know in the thread if any of them really stumped you or maybe and or let me know if any of them were like, oh, this is a very hard one. And then you got it. I would love to know things like that. I would love to get that kind of feedback. I hope it was fun. I hope it was medium difficulty. I didn't want it to be like ding dong level and I didn't want it to be so difficult that it was impossible and not fun. So let's come over here and see. Um, my picture is probably going to stay on there because of the camera I installed, the video capture. Video capture. So, okay, a few things I want to show you. Let me get rid of myself, actually. Let me get rid of myself. A few things I want to show you before we get into all of the business of the day. So I posted this in a lot of groups. Hang on. Let me get rid of me. Um, this weekend I'm teaching uh, in person on Sunday afternoon at Madison Wool from 1 to 4. Madison Wool is in Madison, Connecticut. I'm teaching hooking with quilting fabric. So I was cutting up some quilting fabric, K-Facet, uh, Free Spirit, Tula Pink, all that kind of beautiful stuff um, yesterday and the day before. And uh, the bottom one is the image, the smaller image that we're going to do in class. It's a Prati piece. The whole background is hooked with quilt fabric. It's called Square Peg Bouquet. Um, three more people signed up for the class today, so I was happy to see that. There are still some spaces, I think, if you are in New England and you would like to do Square Peg Bouquet with me, uh, the class comes with a kit. It is advertised on Madison Wool, her website, right? Dana's website is Madison Wool. That's where you sign up. That's where I'll be on Sunday for teaching. Later in the day, in the evening, I am running the color and composition class. This is for everybody. This is for beginners. This is for people who went to art school, right? This is my chance to use all of the years of art school that I did um, and all of the sort of composition and color theory that I have always locked in my head. You know, sometimes I wish that I could remember, for example, what channels are which and uh, what street to turn down to get to this specific place. And I can't because I've got all this old stuff stuck in my head. Might as well use it, right? We're going to be talking about color theory. Um, it's color in terms of emotion, color planning, personal choices as far as colors go. Half of the class is a discussion about color, the color wheel, technical conversation as well as a personal conversation, right? Introspective, giving you things to think about, um, just talking full blast about color, and then second, second half will be composition. So talking about why some compositions are good, meaning successful, why others are less, have less impact. 
um, what kinds of compositions are the most effective, particularly for rug makers, right? Not just for artists, but for rug makers. So it's going to be a three hour with a break in the middle and between the two sort of different segments. Um, really intense but fun class filled with exercises where we are talking solely about color theory and composition, right? If you are interested in doing your own patterns or you're just interested in knowing why when you go to an art gallery or museum and you look at something and it's fantastic and it moves you, why it moves you, right? Finding the answers to those kinds of questions. So both of those things are coming up on Sunday. This is also coming up a little bit further out on the calendar, designing like this month, designing like Henri Rousseau. So lots of folk painting, lots of portraiture, beautiful lush outdoor scenes, desert scenes, um, really, the first um, really professional artist who became known as a folk artist, right? A lot of people credit him with saying like, he was a naive folk painter. Well, he was, he was also during that sort of time period of the Impressionists and early 20th century, very, very important painter in the art history timeline. But he did a lot of stuff that translates very well to rug making because it's very graphic and it's very folky. So if you enjoy those things, you might really like that. Uh, Juliet, yes, the color class is recorded, so you can play it any time later. There's two dates coming up, not just Sunday. There's one other date. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's at least a week away. So there's two dates coming up, and it is always recorded. So same exact class. You're just not live when you watch the recorded version. So you're not able to ask me questions and interact with me because it's recorded. But I run it live twice, and then it's recorded. It's all the same thing, so you'll get exactly the same content. Me too, Chrissy. I'm really excited about it. This is, just to let you know, this is Split Bloom Garden, right? This has been this has been my biggest seller ever. Um, these are shipping tomorrow. I had to wait for the needles because I, I needed more needles. I'm doing it like an assembly line because this is a my first mini punch kit that I've put out. Judy, I owe you this, right, at the thistle. I was going to drop it off and I forgot. Um, I, you weren't there and it didn't trigger in my mind. I'm so sorry about that. I'll, I'll just send it to you as a PDF. Um, this was like an assembly line thing. It was massive because it's 20 something colors and I had to hand wind each of the 20 something for each person. Um, backing fabric, um, everything, right? The, the punch, um, it's got lots of components. The 11 inch square frame I had shipped from the UK. That's a product from the UK. So I finally, I'm waiting for the threaders. They're supposed to be coming today, right? So it's the day is not up yet. They're, sp they're on schedule to come today. So I'm hoping to ship all of these tomorrow. So um, sorry about that. I like to ship within the week, but sometimes um, I have to wait for bits and pieces. And in this case, this kit was so labor intensive and I put it at a really low price considering how much time it took and the cost of the materials. I wanted everybody to get the chance to jump in kind of on the ground floor with it if you liked it and if you wanted to. And a lot of people are and I'm super happy. There'll be lots of mini punched kits in the future. This is the image I was talking about that is on Ribbon Candy Hooking, Klimt's Lady with a Fan. Um, this sold for what, Linda, like 106 uh, million this, this past week, right? This is the highest selling uh, painting, the highest painting that's ever been sold at auction in Europe ever, uh, Klimt's Fan. And this happens to be one that I did for my buddy Courtney. And she's been working on this ongoing. It's an enormous piece. It's more than 36 inches um, um, dimension wise. So it's a large piece, but that is available. Some people have asked for this. This is available at Ribbon Candy Hooking. I had it on private, but it is now public. So you can find that if you love it. Are you ready, rug hookers? Are you ready to sell? Is there any more of the flower kits available? Yes. So um, it went, so many sold so quickly that it went out of stock. Um, hold on just a second. Um, I'm trying to come back to you with my face now. It is back. It is back in stock. So, um, yeah, so it is there. I'm sorry about that. I didn't realize that. It really was like a crazy amount of orders in a short time. Um, but it is back in stock. So it is there and you can get it. There's also a class option for $20, $20 more. There's a class if you want to do the class with me. The class is coming up later this month um, in July. It's in July, right? Um, so that's a possibility too. Or you just get the kit with the tool and the square hoop and all of that. It's really good value, I'm telling you, because those hoops alone are like $11, $12 on Amazon. Um, and that's with Prime, right? So it's like also the punch and it's a vintage punch. I have to see how many vintage punches I have left. I took the vintage punch part out of, out of the description because so many people ordered it. I had enough for everybody who I said vintage punch to and now I have that out, but I think I still have a few more. Regardless, you'll get a dial punch. The Susan Bates punch is essentially the same thing, 
right? It really is. As long as it dials and you can change the height of your loops, it's the same thing that I'm using with my hands. Um, lots more to say on that. There's so many more things coming out that have to do with mini punch, um, but let's do it. Let's do it. Let me get rid of my face again, and let's let's do it. Rug hooker's puzzle. Get your puzzle out in front of you. Get that pencil or pen out. Pen if you dare. Pen if you dare. And let's get going on our puzzle. So first answer, right? So let's do it this way. Hang on. I'm going to come back to you now and then with my face. Let's do it like this. Um, you know, hang on. I'm being a ding dong. I'm being a ding dong. I'm sorry. Uh, hang on. Give me a second to calibrate my brain. I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to say, man, technology is tricky. I'm going to just leave my camera on. I'm going to say, um, let's do, if you have your sheet in front of you, let's start with a cross. So on the first page where you're, if it printed out the same configuration as mine, let's start with one across. This is a term for a decorative cutout that you prop up in front of the fireplace. Many rug hooking patterns are intended for this purpose. And as you just saw, the answer is a dummy board. So if you didn't have dummy board, go ahead and write dummy board in. These are examples of dummy boards. Dummy boards are cut out anything. So I'm going to show you some more examples, right? Um, they can be um, fruit flowers, animals, people, whatever, right? Santa, anything. You see these in rug hooking a lot. It's like now it's maybe um, the fiber board or something, but back in the day it was wood and they were hand painted. Dummy boards date back to the 1600s. It was a huge fad in the Netherlands, these dummy boards. So a lot of people collect them. They are extremely desirable. There are lots of pets like this spaniel, maybe King Charles spaniel. Looks like there's a little butterfly on him. Um, super cute. So you could have one of these painted for all of your fireplaces. If you were a wealthy person, you'd have fireplaces and many pencil is sharpened, Karen. Oh, you have the Klimt piece as a beading kit, Melanie, one of your crazy beading kits. Um, I think I still have some of the vintage punches left, so don't despair. I'll remember that you want one, I promise, I promise, promise. Um, so these are all dummy boards and a great piece of history. This is an example of a dummy board that is contemporary. So, you know, Lori Brecklin of uh, not for, she's not forgotten farm, right? So incredible folk artist, big Etsy seller. She was at Sauter Village in 2017 and she did this project. This was her dummy board project. It was a class in 2017, not this year, Lori Brecklin. And this was her dummy board. So you can see, you're welcome. You can see that, um, um, rug hookers do, you know, when I go to Whispering Hill Farm, um, they have one there all the time of Santa. It's like a big standing Santa because they've done that as past classes in the winter time, big San Santa dummy board. So dummy means like false, right? It doesn't mean that you're stupid. It's a, d it's a dummy board, right? It's not like a, a derogatory term, but um, interesting, isn't it? So good job if you, oh my gosh, I gave it away. Good job if you got that one right. I'm going to stop doing that. Let's do this right. So number four across let's go to the next logical one number four across pearl mcgown developed many patterns based on the beloved etchings of these famous 19th century engravers you got this right you got this if you didn't say courier and ives who would you say right so the answer is courier and ives it's spelled out um, this is a, uh, Currier and Ives, um, they were printers, right? They were New York City printers. The, co the company was founded in 1835 and it ran through 1907, uh, founded by Nathaniel Currier. And what they sold inexpensive prints, like lithographs that were hand colored, based on, at the time, what was like popular culture, right? So it's like, these are all old fashioned scenes to us. Well, they weren't then. Right? These were things that people were doing. These put people in a great mood for festive seasons and different you know, yearly changes, different events that made the wheel of the year keep cranking around and around. People loved these images. It was a big deal, Courier and Ives. Sleigh ride, right? These are famous images. Some are more famous and more popular than others, and we know that because of the way that they sold. So Courier and Ives, very, very popular images during that time. We tend to think of them, at, you know, with winter scenes, but they also did a lot of summer scenes. This, for example, is summer in the country. People have been out riding, uh, maybe on a hunt, right? Or maybe there's just hounds there. 
um, these were American scenes, right? Because this this company was based in New York City, and they were doing very idyllic scenes, um, which I think is interesting because oops, I meant, didn't mean to do that. Um, which I think is interesting because they were right in the center of Manhattan, right? It was like the super melting pot, crazy, crazy, busy, smoggy, industrial revolution days. And they're right there, but they're doing all these beautiful pastoral scenes. This is their most famous ever and best-selling ever print. I think it's called Home for Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving at Home. I think it's called Home for Thanksgiving. Let me see. Does it say on the bottom? Home to Thanksgiving. So while this isn't one of the busy ones, um, I think this evoked a lot of feeling for a lot of people because in those days, right, coming out of Puritan times, particularly Puritan New England, right, um, for, for many, many years at the beginning of the U.S., uh, Christmas was outlawed it, within many Christian communities and Thanksgiving was much more widely celebrated, right? Not officially until Abraham Lincoln, but a lot of people celebrated Thanksgiving, you know, happily, openly, broadly, as opposed to Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, where some people still had mixed feelings, right? Or a different religion. So this one spoke to a lot of people and it was a very, very, their most popular print ever. We see examples of this in rug hooking. This is home, home to Thanksgiving in rug hooked form. So this is a hooked rug that appeared at a Skinner auction, right? Home to Thanksgiving. And let me just pop back here so you can see it's quite similar. Beautiful border added, same kind of feeling. I mean, nowadays you might have to hook it without the snow, right? We just aren't getting the winter anymore, but times have changed. Uh, absolutely beautiful. This is an image from Pinterest. So this is Sleigh Ride, another one of the most uh, popular ever prints. How many Christmas records have this as the cover, right? Because as soon as it went copyright free, everybody was pouncing on that as a Christmas image. Is that the same one or uh, no, I think, did I put it in twice? No, it's a different one. Is that a different one? It is a different one. Look at that. Look at the sky. Get ready. That is a different one. Same pattern, right? So I don't know that these are Pearl McGowan, but I think they are because I have a lot of Pearl McGowan um, rug hooking patterns on burlap that are Courier and I've seen. doesn't mean they are. It means they could be, right? I don't know that this is one of them. And because these images have been out of copyright for so long, other people could have copied them too, right? You didn't need to buy the Permagon if you didn't have access to it. If you could find it from someone else or you could just copy it, you could get it. These two are pretty much the same, right? So chances are they um, are, are Permagon because they're exactly the same. Um, but she did a lot. And one of the really striking things about those Permagon Curry and I've scenes is that some of them are honestly like this big, like a piece of printer paper. And the amount of detail is insane like over the years with the ink bleeding and stuff a little bit you know um because they're like stamped on the burlap um it's really hard to see some of the lines it's just blobs of colors in some cases because it's a very detailed and busy line drawing uh, in a very small space right so that is bound to be a number three right if you're a hooker that is bound to be your number three strips or even smaller, angel hair pasta, right? Angel hair pasta. Our courier knives out of copyright. Yeah, you can absolutely copy them. You can absolutely copy copy them um, because they are, they ended 1907, right? So at this point, I think general copyright for printed material 1928. So yeah, they are well out of, they are more than 20 years out of copyright. So you can absolutely copy them. You can take the image to Staples, have them trace it out or do it on your computer, whatever your transfer method and absolutely you can copy them. So next question, let's go over across the way. Let's go across the aisle. People should be doing that a little more often. Let's go across the aisle down. Let's do number two down. This rug hooking Mecca in Newport, New Hampshire has been supplying the industry wool since 1963. Now I do want to point out that this particular mill, the answer is door mill, D-O-R-R. -R mill, door mill. So you fill that into your space. Um, they were a mill at one point, and it wasn't that long ago. I want to say it's like, I might be wrong. I want to say like 20 years, that kind of thing might be a little more, might be a little less, um, that they are not a mill any longer, right? So they are now importing fabric. Um, I probably shouldn't know that, but I do know that. Uh, it is still the best wool, and it's the wool that I use for sure, right? It folds out really nice when you dye it. It's great industry wool. It's a lot thicker than those old swatches. If you ever get vintage swatches and stuff um, from Dormail, those are much thinner than, um, in my opinion, than the wool they have now. 
So a little bit different, um, but I like the current wool very much. Let's look at door mill. Pamela, good to see you. Checking in late because I really have to work on commissions today. Oh, but you'll watch it later. Very happy to see you, and I'm glad that you have some commissions. I've been looking at all the artwork you've been posting, and you are on fire. I can't wait to see your next stuff for gallery night, too, and your new ideas. So the answer for... Oops, wait a minute, let me get rid of this one and let's come over here. The answer for number two across is Door Mill, D-O-R-R. -R. And these are some pictures I took of Door Mill. Um, I, go qu I go quite a bit. I, um, I have an account there, a wholesale account, because I'm a business too, right, Ribbon Candy Hooking. And I have a lot of fun with Nancy and Jackie who fill those wholesale orders there. Lots of fun. This is the building from the outside. Isn't this a beautiful looking mid-century building? This used to not be my taste at all, but the more I get interested in architecture, um, the more I really appreciate this era of architecture. I think it's just beautiful. There's clothing and, and stuff when you first go in, and then there's a huge rug hooking area. This is me a few years ago standing outside at the sign. I was so ramped up. Oh, I was so ramped up. I was out of my mind. And these are some pictures that I took of the inside. Let me come over here so I'm not so distracting. Of door mill. It's going to make you crazy. So close your eyes if you can't stand um, the craziness. It's just endless piles of beautiful colored wool. Every rug hooker's paradise, right? And nice little vignettes like this. Um, super, super inspiring. This was a few years ago. This was maybe two, three years ago. I go every year, but um, these are the pictures that I, I found most readily. Um, I love their storefront too. So pretty. I would need a lottery win to go there. Oh, don't say that. You know, they have a lot of stuff that's very economical there too. And they have their wool in all kinds of cuts, in really small cuts like um, this little guy, right? Wait a minute. Wait a minute, I went too far back. These little rolls are like, I don't know how much they were. I shouldn't say because I don't know, but it was like a few. Oh, does it say on there? Like $2, $2 for these little rolls. You can get lots of little bits and pieces. I like stuff like this where they put a piece over the wool that kind of um, matches, right? The the hook drug and the, and the bolts. Uh, does Dora have tartans? Um, well, they have some plaids like this, Judy. They don't have a section of tartans. I haven't been this year yet. I'll probably go next week on the way to Vermont. They do have a lot of plaids. I know tartans are different than plaids, so I am reluctant to say yes to that. But if I manage to stop in next week when we head up that way for 4th of July, I will definitely let you know. Or if you want to take a road trip together, we could do that anytime. It's only a couple, maybe two, just two plus hours from where we are. If you ever want to take a road trip, I'm your girl. Um, you couldn't get into the crossword. Um, oh, no. I wonder why, Whitney. That's like that's such a bummer. It is unbelievable. Lots of hoops, lots of comb frames, lots of bits and bobs. I'm just flashing through. Lots of braiding, right? Lots of everything. Really, really beautiful store. Moving on to our next clue. Th number three down. This historic church in New Brunswick hosts over 300 rug hooked cushions that are based on the 50 American states. Do you know the answer to this one? It is the Barishwa Church. So I'm going to spell that out for you if, you're, if you've got your pen up and ready. B-A-R-A-C-H-O-I-S. Barishwa. Um, it's a beautiful church in Nova Scotia. I plan to go there in October. This lovely uh, man, uh, Remy Leves, hold on one second, this is Remy. Um, planned this whole event, all the rug cushions, and he's holding one of them here. Um, this has been like a huge project of his for um, some years now, right? I, I don't actually know if they have um, completed the 50. I know I worked at Ribbon Candy Hooking, I worked very hard at getting people from the different states to sign on for the missing states so that you know, we could be complete on this project and help Remy out. So I'm, head, I'm hoping to head up there in October and do a very thorough cover of that beautiful church. This is an aerial view, view probably from the choir loft, right, of the cushions. I mean, isn't this a heavenly sight for us? I know. It's like the whole idea of it being this beautiful historic church and looking down at all of these cushions. I hooked three of these cushions, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Vermont. Um... Why does the church in Canada have cushions representing the U.S. states? I think it was like, um, I think the idea was like a together thing, like let's get together. Not that we're having like a war or anything like that, but I think it was just um, like, um, I, I don't, I, I know the way he worded it, it sounded super eloquent. And I went, isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Um, yeah, just like it was 
read what he wrote. It's way more lyrical than what I could conjure up. Um, but it's ab absolutely beautiful, the write-up that he did on it. Google Barishwa Church. Um, yeah, and it's it's well it's well marked there. I think there are 300 cushions altogether. Um, you know, you're right. It does say that. It does say that online that there's 300 because I think there's more than obviously there's more than just the 50 states. So it uh, hopefully it's complete now. Hopefully there's every state plus all the other cushions that are there. So they must also represent provinces. Yet yeah, they might also represent places in Canada. Does anybody know the answer to that? Besides the 50 states, are we also representing provinces in Canada? Could that be what it is? Because there's, there's a lot more than 50 there now. I didn't even think of that. Did not do that simple math. 300 minus 50. There is quite a few left over. Um, but it's a beautiful sight, isn't it? Beautiful sight. Let me know if anybody looks that up and put it into the thread, because I don't remember. I don't remember. Aren't I awful? It was. A, I did mine like three or four years. Well, it must have been three years ago now. So it was a while ago. Let's move on to, um, let's go back across to number five across. The clue is this classic Magdalena Briner EB pattern, mm, tree, and I said tree, but sometimes it's bouquet, is often, is often likened to a fruit tree or, in my opinion, a family tree, like a document. Did you know the answer to that? Sometimes called blank tree or blank uh, bouquet. The answer was lollipop for that. So the word lollipop. And I want to show you L-O-L-L-I-P-O-P. -O -P. Um, Linda Ann says he might have thought it would be fun to have the state cushions because they get a lot of American tourists. You know, that's a good thought too. I'm sure they get a ton of American tourists up there. This is a beautiful book on Magdalena Briner Eby, and you can see the original lollipop tree on the bottom between the two horses. This is a wonderful book by Evelyn Lawrence and Kathy Wright, who is one of the people who, who um, sets up Sauter Village, right? So this is a book I highly, most highly recommend. It's a great history of Magdalena, and it's a great scholarly, very academic accounting of her work, where it's been, where it is, what's missing, uh, and as much as anybody knows about Magdalena is here in this book. It's absolutely beautiful. So some people say lollipop tree, some, and this is a little bit dark, sorry about that, I got this picture online. This is lollipop bouquet. So this is the original piece by Magdalena. A lot of people through the years, because she lived on a farm, right, uh, in Pennsylvania. I'm not going to say what county because that's a different question. Oh, Anne says it started up with Canadian provinces, then they opened up to the state. So we had the, the cart before the horse, Anne. That makes a lot more sense. They started with Canada and they came to us in the U.S. Now we're all mingled together. I like that. I like that. Thank you, Anne. That's super, super helpful. Lollipop bouquet, uh, a lot of people thought must be fruit orchard or fruit tree because of her living on a farm. But if you've ever looked up a, like a fracture of a family tree, an early Penn Dutch, right, Lancaster County uh, official document of a family tree, the way that the family trees are drawn in that, in that time, in that part of the world, 19th century Pennsylvania, the tree has bubbles on it, right? Bubbles, not boxes like we see now. And to me, the bubbles look like this. This to me looks more like a family tree than a fruit tree. It could be either. It could be either, but it's interesting. Um, you know, it, that's just my spin on it. I don't, I certainly don't know. And I wish we could ask Magdalena, but uh, you know, she, she lived and died in the 19th century. There are some examples on the uh, Wooly Fox site of, and the, they're not cited who did which of these examples, but I just want to flip through some of these beautiful examples of the lollipop bouquet, lollipop tree. I've done examples of this too. I've got some in ribbon candy hooking. I've got a Halloween version. Um, I've got one coming up in the book that's coming out in a couple of weeks, my, my first book. Um, so this is, a, this is a lot of fun. This is a great old pattern, very well-known pattern. Judy says that lollipop tree looks uh, like, the, like the hooked dummy board you showed earlier, like the bouquet. It really does. It could well be a bouquet of flowers too. That's like the third option people will talk about. Could it be a fruit tree? Could it be a bouquet of flowers, right? Um, could it be a family tree? It could be so many different things because it's very, very simple. So it's very hard to tell. All we know is the way that her life was, it was very simple and it was fairly primitive. Uh, not in a caveman way, like in a 19th century way. Uh, and, and we know what she had access to in her life and that's about as far as the guessing can go, right? Interestingly enough. 
So let's go to our next question. Let's go down to number seven. So seven across. This kind of burlap is considered the Rolls Royce of burlaps with its tidy, hairless structure. Do you know what is considered like the best of the burlaps? It's a little bit sort of waxy. It's very, uh, has a lot of integrity. It's called Scottish burlap. So if you didn't get that, fill in the word Scottish for seven across, Scottish burlap is the next answer. And I put a picture of burlap here. Not much of a picture, right? It's a picture of burlap, but Scottish burlap is considered like the Rolls Royce. It's got a lot of things going for it. It's a beautiful height. I like burlap anyway, um, but it's a very high quality, not hairy, not scratchy burlap. It's a very nice one to work with. It will, it will and can still decompose the same way that any burlap can. Um, but it's going to be a step above, right? Basic burlaps and burlaps, burlaps from the craft store. Let's move to number 12 across. Um, and the clue is, and this is a book title, By Hook or By Crook is a short comic memoir from Stella Ray Blank. You fill it in. It is about the life of a rug hooker told by her long-suffering husband, but she actually wrote it. So she's telling it from the point of view of her husband. Did anybody get this one? This one is a little bit tricky, um, but the answer is Rex, R-E-X. If you looked this one up online, it's tricky because, um, hold on, let me get rid of the burlap. It's tricky because... You see, she also has two books that I've covered on Coffee Time. Two of my favorite older books on rug hooking, right? These are like mid-century books. Practical Hook, Hook Drugs by Stella Hay Rex. So the answer is R-E-X. And her other absolute masterpiece, I even like this one more, Choice Hook Drugs. If you look up online, it might be problematic because somebody wrote something about her online and they put her name as Stella Ray Hex. Like Hex, like so that's incorrect. It's Rex. Um, so if you looked at it, if you're doing cheaty peaties as, as you should and as you can and who cares, um, that was misleading because I saw that and I thought, oh, no, that's a serious typo. Um, so Rex, R-E-X, is the answer. Incidentally, her family caught one of my shows on one of her books. I think I told you this a while back. Um, and a couple of family members wrote me. So I'm still trying to, I just wrote them again today or yesterday because I have been just way too busy. I'd like to take a road trip because they have a lot of her rugs. Everybody in the family ended up rug hooking. So there's a lot of family rugs within the Rex family. They said she always was called Bunny. So they refer to her as Bunny Rex. Um, and I'm really hoping to go up in person and look at some of these rugs in person and talk more about her because she's not well documented. We don't have pictures of her. They do. I'm hoping to document all this stuff and get it written down, whether it's an article form, book form, definitely here for you on the Ribbon Candy Hooking channel. But I want to put it in a more, uh, I want to put it on paper too, so that it is part of our rug hooking history for all of time. You did Rex and crossed it out due to Hex. See, that was really frustrating. I was frustrated when I saw that because I thought, come on, it can happen. But you have to check stuff like this, right? This is, this is history. So let's move on to number 14 across. This fab, and me using that word is a clue, new Cushing dye color called blank pink evokes the wild neon of the psychedelic summer of love. Now, this was a long clue. Did anybody get it, I wonder? little sip. I'm not a barbarian and it's cocktail night, right? Mm. Flower power pink. It is a great color. It is one of my favorite cushion colors. And this is a new color. I was talking to Lizanne Miller about this not that long ago. I said, you know, of all of the newer colors that have come out, like since, you know, the 1950s, this is my favorite one. It doesn't look like anything. The closest color to it is um, Prochem's uh, Rhodamine Red. But this has got a little more blue in it, Flower Power. It's a very unique color, a very exciting color. You got it, Linda. It's a lot of fun. I'll tell you, it makes a mess. It is a big mess maker, but I love it. I love it. So next question, 15 across. You got that one too, Deborah. Good job. 15 across. This form of rug making involves winding wool strips into little wagon wheels or little cinnamon bun rondelles, right, round, and then tacking them into place with a strip. This is Quilly, Q-U-I-L-L-I-E. This is Quilly. Um, and again, spelling, if you're filling it in, Q-U-I-L-L-I-E. I want you to know that I got this image from a website called, Stan no, Facebook group called Standing Wool Rug Making. 
Quilly. Standing wool rug making Quilly. Q-U-I-L-L-I-E. Super, super. That's a fun Facebook page, by the way. Make sure you belong to that. Super fun Facebook page. Quilly really refers to the circle, right? The circle ones, like paper quilling. But a lot of people say, in place of Quilly, um, standing wool meaning it's standing up it's not hooked right it's standing up so you have to attach it to something you usually attach it to itself right other little strips and then you need to stitch it with a needle onto your backing fabric you, it never gets hooked so if you're thinking oh you're using it in a rug hooking piece it's like a multimedia piece or multi-technique piece you are making it to stand up on the surface and then you will need to stitch it down and secure it to your backing fabric and then you can incorporate you know you, you incorporate the quilly or the standing wool motifs into your piece and you can surround it you know with your regular rug hooking and ha having stitched it down it's amazing how the rug hooking really cushions it and hugs it and holds it into place beautifully it's always super mystifying looking at these two forms together on a hooked rug piece because um, they go so well together right same wool number 16 across next clue Historic early rug hooker, again, Matt, and, and I didn't put these in this order, remember, because the crossword puzzle generated the puzzle for me. So another Magdalena, Brian, or Evie question. Magdalena hailed from what county, what county in Pennsylvania? Now, maybe this is one you had to look up. I put it in here because I talk about Magdalena so much on this show, and I know I've said this so much that I thought some of you it's like earworm, right? Some of you, it might be in there. It might be in there permanently. The answer is Perry County. Good job, Linda. P-E-R-R-Y, Perry County. Perry County is here, right? So if you're going, gosh, where is that in, in Pennsylvania? Well, it's right here. And when I looked up Perry County, I saw a lot of this stuff and I thought, oh, this is for me. This is the stuff I live for. I mean, you think that these bridges are only in Vermont, New Hampshire, um, Connecticut, right? Actually, the most, I think, are in Connecticut uh, of surviving ones. Uh, but I don't know about outside New England. Um, I didn't realize that there were these kinds of views in Perry County. This still looks like New England to me. It's not, it's not that far over, though, is it? It's not, it's not like way, way, way west, although the views might continue in the same, in the same exact way. I just thought it looked so beautiful. If you do like a Google search of Perry County, you'll go, oh my gosh, so picturesque. It's incredible. Let's move on to 18 across our next clue. This self-taught artist who hooks by ear, hooks by ear, blank shepherd, is known for among other things, among many things. Uh, his two books, right, two classic books, one on Prati, and he has, I think, more than two books, but his Prati book and his dying book are like the go-to books on those two subjects. Indiana still has quite a few covered bridges. Interesting, Judy. And I know, you know, out of New England, I remember a question came up somewhere, whether it was on a game show or something, where are the most covered bridges in the country? Um, and I was thinking, oh, God, it's got to it's gotta be New England, so it must be Connecticut. It was... Um, was it, um, where's the British, British of Madison County? Is that, is that Idaho? Is that Idaho? Um, oh, it was there. I think it was there. I don't know if that's the same. Of course, we lose these bridges, hopefully not too quickly, but these bridges get lost. There's a great example in, um, Great Barrington. It got burnt down by some kids who were fooling around on the bridge and, I mean, I shouldn't say fooling around because everybody's allowed to go, you know, be a teenager and go sm smoke somewhere, right? That's in itself a very small crime, but the consequence of that was that the old bridge burnt down. And then sadly, not to put a sad uh, twist on the night, but one of the kids who was involved in that ended up committing suicide because the town was livid. And he didn't think, I guess, that he would ever uh, be able to kind of outrun that kind of a legacy. Uh, but we do lose these horrible uh, what's worth more, a human, a human being or a, a bridge, right? Even a beautiful bridge, it's not even a question. But um, super sad, but we do lose these bridges for a variety of reasons. They're old, right? That's the main reason. Wisconsin, oh, is that Wisconsin? Is the, British, the bridges of Mar Madison County, is that Wisconsin? Another reason to come to Wisconsin. December, it's looking like December for me. I have to see if that works out. I don't think I'm gonna make it for the festival this year. Um, I just got that song in my head from um, the musical um, Into the Woods, right? I'm going to go to the festival, but I think that's the Canada, the Canada time, so I'm going to have to see. I'm still playing with dates. I might be able to swing both, but I still want to go this year. 
let me know if that's uh, Madison County is in Wisconsin. That would be a total, total game changer for me. I'm coming tomorrow. Beautiful. So, okay, so um, the answer is Gene Shepard, right? And you probably got that because he is, he is an iconic rug hooking figure. He is a legend in rug hooking. Um, so this is Gene Shepard. And uh, I mean, his work is tremendous, his classes, his website, all of the online stuff he does. This is a very desirable book, Prepared to Die, Dying Techniques for the Fiber Artist. This is the quintessential book, the definitive, Wisconsin in December. Is that really cold, Judy? Like really, really cold? That's not ideal. Well, let me see. Let me see how much wiggle I have. Let me see how much wiggle I have. Because, you know, when I make plans and stuff, I tend to go month to month because I'm like, okay, um, July, 4th of July, um, August, Linda Ann's coming, Ann Sauter Village, September, nothing, nothing in September. So maybe, maybe September could work. Kids back to school, but that doesn't, I was going to say that doesn't have anything to do with me. It does, but you know, if I'm away for a few days, it's not going to be the end of the world. And then October, uh, Canada. It's going to be a busy year with, with uh, hopefully two books coming out this year. Yeah, maybe December isn't the best. I'm going to give that some rethinking. Thanks for, thanks for doing that. I'm going to have to look again because I, I really want to make it work for this year. And this is the other book that's super desirable, Prodded Hooking for Three-Dimensional Effect. So we call this Proddy in general. Uh, the Brits sometimes call it Proggy with two Gs. Um, but he is absolutely um, an icon, absolutely. Iowa, okay, Iowa, Iowa. Thought it began with an I. Um, thank you, that was good. Um, still want to go to Wisconsin. So let's move on to, let's move on to Across. This is Across number 19 Across. This classic fairy tale was depicted by Jane McGowan Flynn, so the granddaughter of Pearl McGowan, and immortalized as a popular rug hooking pattern. Now there are a lot of fairy tale patterns, right? If you look at Pearl McGowan, she's got like Snow White. I think she has Cinderella, but she, maybe she does. She has a few classic fairy tales. She's definitely got um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. She's got at least one. She's got Alice in Wonderland. Um, but Jane McGowan Flynn did one that is very well known. So the image I'm showing you here, the answer is Hansel and Gretel. So go ahead and fill that in, Hansel and Gretel. Um, that is the answer. And this image is from Honey Beehive, right? The store Honey Beehive. I also have this rug. I just didn't have the time to pull it out today. Not this exact one, but a hooked version of it that I am absolutely in love with. Um, I just love, I love this fairy tale. I love all the dark um, connotation that's happening here with this cannibalistic witch and these children uh, essentially orphaned by their father twice. It's just a sad, dark story um, about hunger and, and the danger of the, you know, that the woods represent um, and the lore of something so bright and pretty and beautiful, such an anomaly in the dark woods. It's, su it's, it's a fairy tale filled with motifs and it's a very moralistic fairy tale. We don't always get that, um, but I love the fairy tale. Um, and I love this illustration. I think it's so whimsical. If you look at the plants in the front, very, very whimsical, not literal at all. And this example, again, that is on the Honey Beehive website, has a little bit of proddy in the front, if you can spot that in the center of the red flowers. Um, what's a witch's uh, favorite candy? Ooh, that's a good question. You, st I, you know, I, maybe it's gingerbread man by the look of it. Maybe, I, don't, I, think, I think it's like um, uh, human jerky, like beef jerky, but human jerky maybe caramelized or like um, something like that dipped in chocolate. She's over on the left there under a, what looks like another lollipop tree, but really beautiful pattern, Jane McGowan Flynn, witch hazel, witch hazel. Is that, was that a joke? Baby Ruth, baby. Ah, <laughs> it was a joke. Oh my gosh, baby Ruth, that is so awful. I love it. That is a bit of a dad joke. I love it. If my dad were still alive, he would be sliding off of the sofa right now. Oh, that is so funny. Baby Ruth. Oh my God, that's so awful. I love it. I'm going to say that to the kids when I get home. That'll be traumatic. How funny. Gail, good to see you in Australia. Good morning, my love. That is so funny. That is so funny. Oh, I almost gave you the next one. Holy mackerel. Let's not. Moving on to the next clue, time check. Okay, so uh, okay, so I don't have an image for the next one because it's a U.S. state. So number 22 across, uh, Rug Hooking Magazine is published by Ampre, Ampre Press. What state are they in? You either know it or you don't know it. You've either noticed it on your, on your issues, right, your subscription coming in, or not. Um, and if it's not, the answer is Illinois. Maybe you were able to get some others going, right? And you figured it out, but the answer is Illinois. 
I didn't put a picture of the state of Illinois. I figured it wouldn't be that exciting, and I have a lot of content tonight. Um, but I, Illinois is another place that 2024, you know, I have gone through Illinois tons when I used to be a tour guide, but I've never gone to Illinois. Um, and I'd love to go to Chicago, Chicago, that toddling town, and uh, see whatever department stores are still left there, because that used to be like the great department store city. I know there's lots of pretty suburbs. I know there's lots of, I know, I know a lot of the good stuff and the bad stuff. Uh, but Lincoln's house, there's so every time I like pick up something, there's something about Illinois um, in it. And I'm like, oh, interesting. There's a lot, right? So that's going to be a 2024 thing for sure. Something I need to research. And I, I love going to a new city. I'm not a city person at all, but I love going to a new city where I've never been before. Um, and tell me in the thread, what are some of your favorite cities? And it's okay if there are cities that are close to you and that's why they're your favorite. Because for me, I grew up in Rhode Island and Providence is still my favorite city in the world. I lived in London, I, spent a lot, I lived in Amsterdam for many years, spent a lot of time in the Italian cities, in Paris. I still love Providence the most. I do, I do. And it's maybe heartstrings in part, fun to visit and fun to leave. <laughs> well, if I could get in there and do a little circuit of some of the really fun stuff, I just, Ah, it just calls to me for some reason, you know. Next question. Okay, so that was Illinois. Now let's shoot to number 24, Cross. Edward Sands Frost, the Civil War, sorry for the typo, era tin peddler, who came up with the idea of using tin stencils to create commercial rug patterns, was from what state? So you know it's going to be a U.S. state, right? Um Barcelona. Ooh, I have never been to Barcelona. That's another song from a musical accompanied by Stephen Sondheim. The song is called Barcelona. It's a duet. It's one of my faves. Okay, I have to do it. Where are you going, Barcelona? It's a very cute song between a stewardess and this guy who she's had like a one-night stand with, sorry. And um, he doesn't want her to go, but he does want her to go. <laughs> he talks her into staying by accident. Very cute song. Bunny says, cities, Washington, D.C., love it. San Francisco, love it. And London, love it. I also love London. I think London's my second favorite. I think I know London better than any other city, like even New Haven, right, or any city I live near now. You could drop me in any part, even a bad part, and I would, because I worked in those bad parts when I worked in the theater and um, years ago, and I worked at the BBC years ago in London. That was, a, that was in my 20s. Uh, it was 30 years ago. Holy mackerel. Sedona. Ooh, another one I haven't been to. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it's just fun to go to a new city. You know there's going to be lots of places to eat, maybe a bunch of neighborhoods to check out, right? Just something new, something different, as long as you're safe, right? As long as you're safe and you're ready for the expense of any city. Um, interesting. Beautiful nature-oriented trip. Oh, okay, even in Sedona. I would think so. I don't know that area at all. San Francisco is a lot of fun, isn't it? I had to do my certification for becoming a tour guide in San Francisco, so I was there for like over a month. Uh, it was a great, it was a beautiful city. Lots of culture. I did a, I did a lot of hanging out by myself then, and um, I ate at that place. I think it's called the Garlic Rose quite a bit. I don't know if it's still there. It was fantastic. I love garlic. It, it, the more breath mints you put on my pasta, the better. I mean, just load it up with garlic and it, I'm in heaven. It happened to be that when I did that certification, I had just written a, stor a short story that got collected by Seal Press, S-E-A-L. Um, it was a collection of short stories about Italy. I think it was called Italy, a Love Story. But the book had just come out and I was very proud that one of my, it was a collection of memoir short stories. It was loaded with typos too. I was really unhappy about that. That was a printing thing. That wasn't anything I could have fixed because um, they never sent it to me to proof. But it is, it, it's there with a few typos. It's a beautiful collection of short stories, but I ha it happened to just come out and mine was one of the two stories at that time, I'm tooting my horn, that was mentioned in the reviews as being like a really good, a really good story. It was a true story, and um, it was they were all memoirs, but um, it came out right around that time, and the party for it was right in San Francisco, and I was there doing my tour guide certification, so I got to go to the party, and I got to read like big excerpts of my um, story, like on the mic in front of this big group of people. It was super exciting. It was so much fun. I'm such a pig for attention. I, I really loved that. Barcelona has uh, gorgeous Gaudi architecture, like Dr. Seuss everywhere. I know. That's one of the reasons I'm dying to go. I just love the way it looks. It's super Dr. Seussy. That's exactly what it is. I love Gaudi architecture. I love it. It's so 
gaudy. I guess that's where the word gaudy comes from, right? I never realized that. New York City, another favorite. Maybe I do like cities after all. All right, so let's see. What state did Edward Sands fr Frost come from? <laughs> We've named a lot of places, uh, but the answer is Maine, and I know that you know that. I know that you know that. Um, Edward Sands Frost came from Maine. He ended up moving out west, I think, to California uh, for health reasons. Um, but this is an example of an Edward Sands Frost um, pattern, right? So the lion is a classic pattern. Always be careful if you're a collector and you are buying at like this kind of uh, price tag level. Always be careful because while there are a lot of Edward Sands Frost, one of his great competitors is someone else we've talked about a lot on the show, Ebenezer Ross. And Ebenezer Ross did a lot of exact copies of Edward Sands Frost. So Edward Sands Frost was doing this designing and then he left. And Ebenezer uh, was also a New Englander, very local. They were well aware of each other and the patterns crossed over. Copyright was not a thing in those days. So Ebenezer Ross did a lot of Sands Frost uh, patterns. So sometimes I think people think they have a Sands Frost, but they actually have a Ross. And I don't know that it matters a lot because in terms of age, they're about the same age. But if you think you're collecting Frost and you are accidentally collecting Ross, that is a bit of a pull the rug out, right? Um, so that's just an important thing to keep in mind if you do collect at this kind of money level. Um, so these kinds of rugs would be definitely in the at least low thousands. Um, and they can go higher if the market spikes again. The market's not spiking right now. I would expect a rug like this to probably go for between 2500 and 3500 um, it's worth more than that. I think it's definitely worth more than that, but that's just where the market is at at this moment. Next question. Um, 27 across. This fun fabric technique popularized in the 1970s and akin to quilting involves the localized stuffing of key areas to make them puffy, right, to make them puff up. And I know you know the answer to this. It is Trapunto. And here is a beautiful example of a contemporary trapunto, right, that you stuff from the back. I talk about this a lot. This image is from a website called Fave, F-A-V-E, Quilts, Fave Quilts. So the answer for this is trapunto, T-R-A-P-U-N-T-O, trapunto. So congrats if you got that. Congrats if you got all of these thus far. Does it, did anybody get all of these thus far? We're going to move on to number 27 across. Women struggled to find feed sacks for their rug backings until this country began manufacturing burlap. I bet you know what this is too, right? Because this is a kind of a similar story to today. Um, India was ahead, was ahead of us. It wasn't that they were ahead of us. It was that there were so many embargoes and stuff during the Revolutionary War. We were not buying products from England, right? That is where, that is where the mills were. And that was the part of the triangle of the, tri of the triangular trade, right? God forbid, but it's part of our history and part of their history too. Um, so we weren't using those mills. And there was a big shakeup for a while. That's why so many people brought looms, even simple looms into their house to be able to make homespun fabric, meaning you, you did it at home. You did it in, the, in your room, right? In the big room that everybody shared downstairs, that one big room. You did it there because there was a long time when people could not get material, right? So um, yeah, manufacturing is a bit of a moving target. That is a whole other conversation. Why and where cloth has been manufactured over time is a whole other conversation. Very interesting, but that's for another day. So the answer is India, um, and I want to show you feed sacks, the kind of feed sacks. This is the image I have for this one, 27, no, I'm sorry, 29 across. Um, so people were using, I mean, these are newer feed sacks than like, you know, the 19th century. These are 20th century feed sacks for sure. Um, but these are the kinds of sacks that women would be using and not necessarily printed, right? Not feed sacks like quilters use, right? Because quilters use cotton feed sacks that were printed during the Depression as a kind of, um, what's that P word? Somebody told me when, what, Melanie, was it, did you tell me that P word? Not promotion, um, you know, like um, um, when uh, McDonald's and Burger King give something away for free, right? It's, it's like it stimulates. Uh, what's it called? It'll come to me. Better not be a 315. But um, those cotton feed sacks that are printed, you know, with, with um, pretty bright 1920s Depression era colors, that's not the same thing as the feed sacks we're talking about. We're talking about burlap feed sacks, grain bags, potato sacks, wovens, right? Not cotton, wovens, like woven burlap. Um, 
so as soon as India started manufacturing feed sacks, right, your rugs could, uh, I'm sorry, India started manufacturing burlap, you didn't have to stick with the feed sack shape and size or attaching a bunch of them. You could have a much larger piece, right? So other things became available. The size could change. And then we're looking at much more easily without patching and cobbling, um, having much larger rugs. So this was a big moment in time. Okay, so let's move, let me get rid of that and let's move on to number 31 across. Wife to James Hutchinson and co-designer of their comical and now very collectible early 20th century rugs. So James Hutchinson and his wife was very distinctive, very old name, Mercedes Hutchinson. So Mercedes, M-E-R-C-E-D-E-S, just like you would think, just like the car, bless you. Mercedes Hutchinson was the wife. And I'm going to do another great plug for Kathy Wright. Um, and, in, and in this case, also Janet Connor, another legend in rug hooking. This is another book um, published by Rug Hooking Traditions, James and Mercedes Hutchinson. Right? This is... Ugh. This is like the same format, right? It's very similar looking to the Magdalena Briner, uh, E.B. Briner book. It, it, there's a reason for that, right? It's the same press. Kathy Wright is one, is one of the two co-authors co again. Um, the third one, I think, is Patty Yoder, and there's a second person with Patty Yoder. There's only three in this series. These are super, 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 super well-researched books, right? I always love great scholarship uh, great, thorough, and accurate citing of information, footnoted information, uh, proper scholarship. Um, this whole series of books is absolutely that. They are outstanding. So this one is called James and Mercedes Hutchinson. You can find it online for sure. And this is the back of that very same book. So you see uh, James and Mercedes. She was a very slight person, a little pixie-like person, really beautiful, very petite, very elegant, very striking, but she seemed very dramatic, you know. It's a great book, just like the Magdalena book about the, the, the couple, right, them as people. Um, just really fun read and lots of great images. Now, next one, I'm going to move along. I'm keeping my eye on the time here. So I'm moving up to this part of the page now, uh, right here, right, second column. So now we're talking about down. Um, so number six, down. This early rug shape or style, it's both a shape and a style, is referred to by its placement in the house. You put it somewhere specific and it's referred to as that. It is a hearth rug. It goes in front of the hearth. But as modern scholarship tells us, it does not go in front of the hearth if there's a fire, right? Too much work, right? We thought that originally, but the sort of definitive writer, I covered this on Coffee Time too, on hearth rug said, of the hundreds of examples that she saw, there was only one example that had any trace of um, anything coming out of the fire and hitting it. None of the others did. So it seems like that was a pretty large survey and the scholarship shows that people really didn't put them in, in front of the fire, in front of the hearth, when, the, when it was not winter and the fire was going, right? Because it was just too much work. Um, that's where the scholarship is at these days. So the answer is hearth. And this is the hearth sized and shaped rug. Depends on what your hearth size was, right? If your hearth was really, really wide, like, a, like it would have been in these oldest houses, right? And you had a hearth where you would cook, it had lots of little compartments. You had your cat there set up to balance a pot on, all of the arms that come um, sliding or um, 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 telescoping out, Happy Friday, Kara. And you know, a lot of people had like beehive oven, Dutch oven, all different little sneaky, sneaky dickies in the wall for cooking. So the hearth could be very, very wide. It could be the whole wall. And if it was, you'd want your rug to extend right across, right? That was the idea. It was a decoration for in front of the hearth. So the answer for number six down is hearth. Take one little swig here. I'm getting to the bottom of the barrel here. I know you're going to know this. Eight down. This famous pattern has historically been one of the best, one of the two best selling Garrett Blue Nose patterns ever, ever. Um, so I'm going to say it's not the Blue Nose. Blue Nose is number one. This has historically been number two. And it is, I know you know, it is the Three Bears, right? So this is um, the second best selling of all time Garrett Blue Nose pattern. This is a great favorite. The Blue Nose is a schooner. 
right? And it's also on the Canadian Quarter, I found out over time. Um, but this is the second best selling, another very whimsical um, it's fairy tale, another fairy tale rug, right? So the answer to that is three bears, number eight down. Number nine down, this one was harder. Maybe you had to look this one up or maybe you remember it from coffee time. We've covered everything here in coffee time, right? So by way of review, it's kind of fun to take a trip down memory lane. It was fun for me too. I actually wrote all these questions in bed. I was up until 1.48 a couple nights ago doing this in bed. It was the end of the day. It was the only time I had any quiet time. I was with Jossie, she fell asleep and I was scratching these down. I was thinking about all our older episodes of Coffee Time. So if you like these conversations and you're new and you're just getting a nugget of something that sounds like there's a much bigger story, look up some of these keywords on the Ribbon Candy Hooking channel, shameless plug, because I have hundreds and hundreds of videos where we talk about all of this stuff in great detail, whole episodes and sometimes multi-episodes devoted to just one subject. So lots to learn, very history-driven uh, commentary through the years on, on um, Ribbon candy hooking. Um, so the question here for number eight, no, I'm sorry, for number nine down, this author slash historian, Mildred Cole Blank, specialized in recording the history of Maine's hooked rugs. I wonder if anybody just got this, because maybe you have uh, one of her books. Her, one of her books, the answer is uh, uh, Pelado, P-E-L-A-D-E-A-U. P-E-L-A-D-E-A-U, Pelado or Pelagia, probably Pelado because she's American. Um, amazing person. She was an amazing person. This, oh, I'm sorry, not that, but this. Uh, this is her. So this is Mildred. I forgot I had a photo of her. So beautiful. She, her life was between 1928 and 2007. Um, so she died in uh, 2007. She had a long um, illness. She had Parkinson's, right? So this was like a long lingering illness. She had an exciting life too. She went to school for nursing, but she ended up becoming a reporter uh, for the Lewiston Daily. And her husband was also a reporter. Uh, Mildred worked in both the State Department department, but also on the society desk, like for the newspaper. Um, and she was also a founding member of the Maine Press, right, as it's now known, and also TV and radio women. Right. So she, I mean, she had a very sort of illustrious, um, very busy and important life. She ended up opening a shop called Needlecraft Corner in Hollowell, Maine, uh, at which she operated for many years. And as soon as, as that closed and she ended that part of her life, she published uh, this very important book, which is really the definitive uh, book on rug hooking in Maine. This is her book, published by Schiffer, Mildred Cole uh, Pelado. Uh, Rug Hooking in Maine, 1838 to 1940. This was published in 2008. So this was a big deal. This book is a big deal. It is thick. It is like, if you can see me over on the side, it is like thick, 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 right? Uh, really, really a big, beautiful, colorful book, full color, tons of history, tons of inspiration, tons of examples. This is another, you must have this book in your rug hooking library. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, absolutely beautiful. I was gonna give away accident, accidentally another clue. I'm not gonna do that. I also have this book. This one's a little bit harder to find. It's often on eBay. It could be there now for all I know. Uh, Art Underfoot, the story of Walderboro hooked rugs. I think I might've given away a future clue. Uh, guest curator, Mildred Cole, Pelado. So this is um, her second book. This is a much skinnier book, but if you want to talk about just Walderboro rugs, um, this is the book for you. So see if you can find this. A lot of uh, cross-pollinating with this crossword puzzle. Sorry about that. I think I just gave away two answers. Um, yeah, so the answer was uh, P-E-L-A-D-E-A-U. Congratulations if you got that right. That was fantastic. So moving on to number 10 down, this is hard. This abbreviation represents a method of over dyeing wool that is explained in three small books dating to the 1950s. These are very small little books. So it is like an acronym. It's three letters, as you know from the crossword, and it's actually the acronym is for triple over dyed, right? Did anybody get that? So the acronym is TOD, TOD. And this is a method that was uh, created by Lydia Hicks for over-dyeing wool. 
and it is a jar method, right? In all these books, it is a jar method. So a very small, these, these are small books, these are pamphlets, but filled with information. This is the complete series, I think, um, book one, two, and three. So Lydia Hicks, and again, the answer is T-O-D, Todd, for triple over died. She, she trademarked that expression. Um, cute, set, cute set of books. Interesting. Maybe when we get into the dying segment, I'm afraid, remember we were going to do a huge dying segment and then things went crazy at the end of last year. I'm shooting for autumn again, um, early autumn, like September, to do just dying for like a whole month. So maybe we'll look specifically like in a couple of episodes at the TOD method, the Todd method, um, Lydia Hicks's method, and see how that compares to other methods. There's lots of techniques from the mid-century, right? So something else that we can think about for the future. But for now, let's move on to number 11 down. Eclectic rag rugger Diane Cox lived in this famous, now this isn't necessarily rug hooking, this is just tricky geography. Diane Cox lived in this famous Cornwall town known for its wild waves, smuggling lore, a little bit of Gil Gilbert and Sullivan clue right there, and literary legends like Agatha Christie and Daphne du Maurier, who didn't live in this specific town, but they lived on the uh, English Riviera and, and very close by. And the answer is, I wonder if anybody got this, Penzance. Because we've also done quite a lot of talking in episodes about Diane Cox. She's one of my favorite people. I am still in touch with her son, Jack, and we are working on a project. I'm working on a project. So I need to link up with him again. It has just been a lot with two books in a row. But this is all great material, and I am on it. So I want, because Diane Cox passed away, and when she did, I got in touch, and uh, Jack and I have been writing back and forth. But she was in Penzance, and she had a beautiful studio there. It was very, he wrote, um, and I think I said this on Coffee Time, when he was, I think, either headed to or headed back for the weekend of going to her studio to kind of organize stuff. It was just heartbreaking um, correspondence, you know, because um, she died way too young. I absolutely love Diane Cox, too. Good job, Linda. You are a good listener. You're good. You're good. So the answer for that, again, was Penzance. Oh, and let me show you Diane Cox. Wait a minute. Um, right here. She was absolutely gorgeous woman in her studio. So colorful, so British, so rag-ruggy. I love the rag-rug feel to it, right? It's not the pristine, like, even pile. It's wild and woolly. Uh, this, these are examples of her work, right? Because I have done full episodes, D-I-A-N-E-C-O-X, right? Absolutely beautiful work. Remember her little red handbags and some of her pieces? She does a lot of a sort of applique. So this is mixed uh, quilting technique with uh, rug hooking technique. She does a lot of applique uh, in, in this as well, right? I almost gave away another clue just now, but there's more than one technique here. Um, there's actually three things that are answers in this one. I think this is my favorite one of hers. I just love this so much. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I got to get on that again. I absolutely love her. I love her. 13 down. This is a term for when you use... Okay, let's get our heads in the game. This is a term for when you use colors haphazardly um, rather than with a particular color plan in mind. What do we call that in rug hooking? We call that hit or miss. So the answer is hit or miss. Either it's a hit or you miss, right? It's not exactly a hit. It's usually a hit though. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to show you Penzance as well, right? So this is still coming off the uh, Diane Cox. Penzance looks absolutely beautiful. It's like, when, when are we going? Should we plan a trip together? When are we going? Isn't it gorgeous? Isn't it gorgeous? But the answer is um, for 13 down, hit or miss. So this is an example of an antique hit or miss rug, or at least a vintage hit or miss rug. The whole center, total haphazard color placement. There is no color plan. You're not going stripies. You're not going red to blue to yellow. No, you're just picking up strands. You're picking up wool strips or worms out of your rag bag, and you're just plugging them in as you go along. And also with this example, the border is also hit or miss, right? All those blocks in the border, those are also hit or miss. This is another example of a hit or miss rug. Um, this is more, this is like a basket weave, right? So up, down, up, down, up, down. This is one we see more often. Sometimes we see this as a checkerboard configuration where every other one has a flower or a different motif. And then we have the hit or miss stripies in every other one. So these are examples of antique uh, hit or miss rugs. 
a lot of people use hit or miss as just part of the rug, like part of the color planning. Uh, you don't have to use it, oh my gosh, we have to speed up for the whole, for the whole thing. Next one, let's go. Um, okay, this is a variety of high pile rugs originating in Scandinavia and comprised of knotting the yarn in rows. So I'm going to add that this form of rug making also sometimes, uh, let me mark them off as we go so I can remember where I am, is confused with latch hook. But when you flip it over, you know that it's not latch hook because, um, whoop, Teddy, every Friday night, isn't it? Yes, Judy, it is Rhea Rug, R-Y-A, Rhea Rug. And incidentally, I'm just going to let, oops, I'm just going to let you know, this is an example of a Rhea Rug. I got all of these from Melinda Bird's website, which is Bird Call, B-Y-R-D, Call Studio in Maryland. And when I go down to Delaware in July, right, that's not that far away, I am going to be stopping at Melinda's, recording a video, and starting a Rhea Rug. And I'm going to take you with me while I do that. So rear rugs are knotted rugs. They are not done with a latch hook. They are done in a completely different way. It is a, is a knot that you have to make. Uh, they are in little rows. They are very, this is another image from Melinda Bird. Um, we're going to talk more about this in July while I'm with her in person. So I've been in touch with her about meeting up in person in Delaware. Uh, I'm sorry, in Maryland next month, July. And this is her classic book. And I have covered this on Coffee Time. We, I think, immensely enjoyed this episode. Uh, Melinda Purcell Bird, Rhea Rugs, Design and Make Your Own. Her website's fantastic. Her store is fantastic. This book is fantastic. And she wrote recently and said everything's back in stock because remember uh, coming out of COVID and all that, which of course we're not exactly out of, everything was backed up. We're still experiencing this in business, right? I'm still experiencing this. A lot of businesses are. Uh, she was experiencing this in a horrible way and now she's back into stock and caught up with her backings so if you were looking at the idea of doing rear rugs and you were like oh shouldn't have any backing what am i going to do it's back in stock um, again i'll be there next month so i'm going to be doing at least one show with her and talking a lot about rear rugs it is going to be so much fun so much fun so moving on to number 20 down this is one you should know too from all of our shows um, don't you love a pencil that doesn't have a tip, right? Isn't that, a, it's like a, the printer without ink, right? When you're trying to print your boarding pass. Uh, 20 down, this rug hooking mother worked closely with her son, Vic Hugo. Uh, her, her last name is not Hugo. For many decades to create some of the most unique patterns in the rug hooking catalog. You must know this. Ribbon Candy Hooking licenses all of these patterns. This is Alice Butler. I've done many shows uh, devoted to Alice. This is the book put out by uh, the nephew, Rob Hugo, Alice Butler Book of Hooked Rugs. This is a cool, and wall hangings. This is a classic must have, classic must have. Um, lots of information about all of the rugs, right? I cover them, he covers them better in the book. This is called Starfish. This one was actually done by Alice and her husband Merle while Vic was away working, right? After he'd grown up and moved out. When she signs her rugs BB, it's for the two butlers. Alice and Merle, her husband. So BB, Butler, Butler. That's how we know who collaborated, who collaborated on the rugs because Alice was not a designer. Um, so I think this is an A, oh no, this is an HB. So this is Hugo Butler. Um, Hugh, so Vic Hugo, Alice Butler, so mother and son. Um, this is called the Chicken Family, right? And I've described all of these in great detail. Um, I bought a kit from her. I completed it and enjoyed it. Deborah, do you remember which one it is? I, I, I send so many out for orders. I think I forgot, but um, I mean, I love all of them. I love all of them. This is uh, the one that was their personal favorite. It's called Spectators. And they entered this into like a state uh, exposition and it won, he thinks it won first or second prize. Um, it, it's funny that he didn't remember that in his lifetime. Um, he, he died, um, Vic Hugo, uh, the winter before last. So this is another mother-son collaboration, really fantastic. You have the chicken family from me. Okay, great. I love the chicken family. People have bought a lot of these patterns, and I'm so glad that you have because they are fantastic. One of them, Chattering Birds, it's on the wall over here. You can't see it where you are. Um, Chattering Birds was featured in Rug Hooking Magazine, and it was the free pattern of the month, that month that it was. I can't remember when I wrote that article. It was this past, last year, right? Not this year, last year. But Chattering Birds was like the pattern of the month. So I hope a lot of people did that one too. Question number 21 down. So th we're, gonna, we're talking British terms now, and I'm going to speed it up. Oh, a rear rug kit. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Let me know how it goes. I, I bought one too. 
um, that I haven't started yet. I'm going to start it with Melinda when I get there. Um, so British terms, like hooky or proddy or proggy, this is a, a UK term, so a, a UK rag rug style, but this style has a clipped pile. Now, after I did it and sent you the clues, I realized there's two spellings of this word, and I am sorry about that. The answer is clippy, and the way I spell it, right, because they spell almost all of these forms with an I-E, I spelled it C-L-I-P-P-I-E, and that is correct, but so is C-L-I-P-P-Y. On this form, it's got to be C-L-I-P-P-I-E. I'm sorry about that. I forgot there were two different spellings. These are unofficial words, right? These are just what pe how these rugs go by through the years, right? These are old, older forms than rug hooking. So clippy can be spelled two different ways. I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking 148 in the morning, right? Um, but I spelled it with the I-E. So I hope that didn't throw you for a loop. This is an example of a clippy rug, right? So you can either... It pull through or push. See, it's proddy if you push through. It's clippy if you pull through. Because if you're pulling it through, it's like a hook drug, and then you clip the pile, right? So you're clipping the pile. Like a lot of rug hooking artists do clip the pile. So if you are rug hooking with any material, right? And these are cl this is a classic rag rug form. And then you clip the pile. It is in British terms known as a clippy. So again, the spelling that I gave it: C L I P P I E. Uh, and again, there are two spellings. What a ding dong, ding dong. Moving on to number 23 down. Um, in 1974, Joel and Kate Kopp, with a K, were guest curator, curators for the groundbreaking exhibition of hook drugs held, held at the uh, Museum of American Folk Art. And they later wrote a comprehensive book on, the, on antique hook drugs called uh, and sewn rugs called Folk Art Blank American Hooked and Sewn Rugs. You have starfish, Melanie. A lot of starfish is sold. That was one of the most popular ones in sunflowers. I think starflower, starfish and sunflowers were the two most popular ones that I've done so far. And I've done a lot though. I've done a lot. They're all such fun. So the answer for this is underfoot. Just like Mildred Pelado's book, it's the same tag, folk art underfoot, right? Two different periods of time, but the, the word to fill in is underfoot. So for number 23 down, underfoot. American hook drugs and folk, uh, uh, hook drugs and sewn rugs, uh, folk art underfoot. Joel and Kate Cop. don't be confused. This is the book and this is the same book, right? So if you're looking, oh, maybe they did a volume two. No, they didn't. It's, it's a reprint with the same cover. So don't, don't, uh, be tripped up by that. It is the same book. It is one book. There is the one book. It's these two different co covers, right? So don't buy it twice on eBay because you go down the rabbit hole and you go nuts and you got uh, shopping trigger finger. Um, it's the same book. So moving on to number 25 down, this elusive Rhode Island hooker, Blank Nye Toby, is best known for her state rugs at the Shelburne Museum. This is one of my favorite hookers of all time. I think my favorite hooker of all time. Um, I'm not going to start with that because there's like s some sad twist to the story. I almost had like three of her rugs recently and the woman like sold them after I said, said, I want, I want them. I'll buy them. I'll come anytime. Tell me when to come. Um, and then I guess, I'm sure it was a legitimate misunderstanding, but she didn't realize I wanted to buy them and they slipped right through my hands because I've been working with the Toby family for years on more scholarship on the family and on Molly. So I was one of the big, uh, punches to the throat I've ever biggest I've ever had um, this is one of Molly and I Toby's rugs they're very few and hard between they're very hard to find um, that's why I've been working a lot with but the family's kind of split in half um, so I've been working with both sides for like three years now but these are examples of Molly and I Toby rugs original designs we know that she had hundred she was born in the late uh, 19th century she died in I think 1984 um, she had hundreds of students and she made hundreds of rugs in her lifetime and to track any of them down at this point is almost impossible. It has been so difficult. I've put a lot of time into it and I've got a lot more work to put into it. So um, if you hear about her, if you hear about her new rugs, please let me know. I have worked so hard on this. I've traveled, I've logged hours with family making phone calls. I'm trying to get this story uh, firmed up because yes, the state rugs at the Shelburne Museum are fantastic, but there are hundreds and hundreds more rugs out there. And I, yeah. I did one bingo night one night that was just a Molly and I Toby. It was a state rugs night. That was a fun episode. 
So the answer to that was Molly, M-O-L-L-Y. Moving on to number 26 down, this brand began on a Canadian family farm during the 1950s and, uh, sorry for the typo, became known for their extraordinary and unique mid-century style until they closed in 1984. I will add that it was the mother, the daughter, and the son-in-law, right? And they kept this thing going for all those years to 1984, coming up with a lot of very avant-garde patterns, very traditional patterns too. The company's called Rittermere, and I've certainly done lots of episodes on Rittermere. Um, and we don't, they're defunct now, but R-I-T-T-E-R-M-E-R-E, -E -E, the best of rug hooking design, the best of commercial design. So why do I keep doing that? I'm sorry. So this is a Rittermere rug. I wouldn't say that this is kind of um, signature Rittermere. Um, this is based on an older tapestry, right? But there's a lot of this. There's a lot of florals. There's a lot of work that's similar to the Pearl McGowan style, uh, to the Mrs. David style, to lots of, um, you know, 1950s, 1960s type designing. But there's a lot of really avant-garde stuff like this beautiful, I forget what this one is called. This one came and re went really fast, I think, on eBay or Etsy. I missed it. But this is one of the ones, if you watch the Rittimer episode, we spend a lot of time on this pattern. Very avant-garde, very different, uh, very... Um, I don't want to say hip, but more artsy than a lot of the other commercial uh, rug hooking design companies that we saw at the same time. Absolutely love Ritamir. If you don't know a lot about them, check out that past episode on ribbon candy hooking. Just put in Ritamir, R-I-T-T-E-R-M-E-R-E. -E -E. Fantastic. So much good information there. Let's move on to number 32 across, 32 across, rug hooker Helen Blank set up a very early 20th century rug hooking industry in a remote part of New Hampshire and specialized in designs that were based on Native American motifs. I'll give you a further clue and say, we sometimes refer to these as Abenaki rugs, right? Because that was like, that was the group of Native Americans that she had the most experience with in terms of geography and proximity. But her designs, her name is Helen Albee. So A-L-B-E-E. -E. You can fill that in, A-L-B-E-E. -E. Um, her designs are really a composite of lots of motifs from all of the Native American art that she'd seen, not just the Abenaki. Um, Abenaki has lots of spellings too, but the solution for this is A-L-B-E-E. -E. Uh, this is a beautiful example, very few examples. These are clipped rugs. If you think that you're encountering um, a Helen Albee rug, right, because these are like mission rugs. This was like an industrial enterprise, rug hooking enterprise, to pop the economy of this remote part of New Hampshire. This is in the 19 zeros, right, like not even 1910. These are 19 zeros. She also wrote a definitive book. I have a great coffee time. I think a couple of great coffee times about her. Um, fantastic. But this is an image from the New Hampshire Historical Society. And um, they have a couple of her rugs there. Very hard to find her rugs. Very, very, very hard. But this would be an example of what she perceived to be a Native American inspired design. She thought this is the very sort of height of taste and sophistication. She did not like flowers and scrolls. This is what she meant to do. Um, and she did a lot of this and it was extremely popular. So it turns out she was quite right. Let's move on to number 36 across. This classic rug hooking motif has other names like clamshell or scallop. I bet you got this one right. This is what, and it is entrancing, Judy. It is absolutely a beautiful piece. The answer is lamb's tongue, one word, lamb's tongue. It literally looks like a lamb's tongue, like a tongue. So this is a lamb's tongue, tongue rug, right, which would be made out of wool. Sometimes these are called penny rugs, but they're not using the Civil War shaped penny as a template, right? These are, these are officially and correctly lamb's tongue rugs, and they're sometimes called pen wiper rugs because you could detach each of the little lamb's tongues um, a man would have this like on his desk with his ink pot and his uh, pen and he could wipe the nib of the pen onto a tongue and when it got dirty it could be removed and cleaned or removed and replaced. So these are, are individually called pen wipers but this um, shape is called lamb's tongue and we see it often in rug hooking. This is an image from Cushing, the Cushing Company, right, also in Maine. Cushing and this, this is just an all over lamb's tongue motif or scallop or clamshell. And this is me in a picture uh, this past winter. I was working on the pattern called Love Weed. And you see how I have lamb's tongues 
um, drawn onto the top and bottom of the pattern. So that is what a lamb's tongue is. If you got that right, congrats. Good job. Good job. Let's move on to number 37 across. Um, this is a famous 20th century artist called Marguerite Blank. She became interested in rug hooking in order to spend more time in the living room with her family. She was a painter. Her husband was a sculptor. Um, she realized that she was never around. They had kids, right? And she was, she was the female, so she was the caregiver. He was off doing a sculpture, right, in, in his studio. But she, there was, the kids were just, like, at home, and she wasn't there because she was trying to work, too. So she said in her lifetime, well, the reason I started doing textile, textile art, specifically rug cooking, was so I could stay in the family room and be with the family, right? Because this is the job of a woman. It fell to her. It fell to her even though she was a proper and well-known artist, too. Her name is Marguerite Zorak. So Z-O-R-A-C-H. This is her here. The solution is Z-O-R-A-C-H, Zorak. Um, really interesting, fun person. Another uh, many episodes where I talk about um, the Zorax together, but specifically Marguerite. Marguerite, because she did some beautiful rugs, and this is an iconic one. I think this is called Belted Pig. This is one of hers, and all the food around the border that I guess the pig eats, right? Absolutely iconic rug. This was at Sauter Village, I think, last year. Uh, this is another iconic, I'm sorry, Zorak rug. Um, a, a snake and a bird, right? So this is an abstract. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in heavy detail because we've got a bunch more s um, clues to solve. But what I will say, composition-wise, foreshadowing, right, if you're taking the color and composition class, this isn't the kind of composition, right? You see the snake, now that you know it's called snake and bird, um, you see, and you probably see butterflies too, like lots of leaves and butterflies. This is a heavily patterned piece, very signature early 20th century piece, right? This is 1937, wool on linen. This is hooked. This is not a piece where you would say, um, is the bird, does the bird have, have enough contrast? Does the snake have enough contrast? Am I not using the right colors? Am I not popping the two main motifs well enough? These are conversations that rug hookers have. These are not necessarily conversations that artists have. I'm not saying that one is right or that one is better than the other. I'm just saying I think my personal opinion is that as rug hookers, we get tripped up too much with that kind of thing. Because when you look at this, you're like, what is it? Right, and then when you read the title, that helps a lot. But they do get lost because this is this style, right? This is like coming out of the deco style. This is this style of design. It's very graphic, it's very flat, it's very colorful. There is no attempt at shading. It should not be shaded, not in 1937. This is the style. It's very graphic, it's very textile driven, right? It's very color um, 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 de derivative. Right. I mean, it's really, it's not the kind of thing where you look at it and you go, oh man, look at that snake and bird. It's making the point, I'm making the point, that sometimes we get tripped up with our designing and we're too focused on, oh, it's not popping enough. Better, better run across the color wheel and find the opposite color. If you want to, then yes, and we will talk about that during the color and design class. But just like with rug hooking, this conversation with rug hooking about do I want to hook, do a lot of shading, work in the permagown style, which I have not, nothing against. It just is the largest and best known style, right? We know that. You know. Um, it's just one moment in the craft, just like 1937 Bird and Snake is one moment in painting, right? It doesn't mean all of the other errors are right or wrong. It's just another example of how it can be done. Right? None of them are right or wrong. It's always going to be up to you as an artist, as a designer, as a viewer, right, who's just looking to go, oh, you know what, I like that. And isn't it good to know why you like that? Right? Because when you, you don't have to justify it to anyone else, but for yourself to say, oh, I like that. And you know, now that you mention it, it does look like a textile. Well, it does look like a textile because it's the 1930s, right? This is where we're at with like painting. But in rug cooking, I think we get a little bit too tripped up with the technicalities, right? And I think the reason for that, and again, this is not a, this is not a negative statement on anybody or anything, but I think with rug hooking, as opposed to artists, um, we are not necessarily trained, right? You, you, you're pulling up loops, right? I don't personally feel that you need to be trained. You're doing one stitch. It's called pulling up a loop. You do it from now until death, right? You pull up lots of loops. You do it in different styles. You do different patterns. You do different techniques. You do wider ones, skinnier ones, uh, higher ones, lower ones, ones out of ladder eyelash material, ones out of thick, heavy sweater wool. You do all kinds of things, but at the end of the day, you're pulling up loops, right? This is a thrift craft. 
Whereas with painters, historically, most painters who got anywhere with their lives, with their agents, with their careers, with their selling, right, enough so that they would stick with it and we would know their name, they do have some kind of a training, or at least they're in the company of other people who have had a lot of training. And they're able to say, well, I know that rule, but I'm absolutely breaking it because that's just, that's just a rule. There's lots of rules. What's to say that I have to do that one? I, I like this way better. And there's other people working in this style, right? It's because one is not better, one is not better than the other. So this is a conversation that happens a lot in fine art, but it doesn't happen often in rug hooking. It happens a lot in this channel on rug hooking. Maybe I should stop. All right, so let's go on to number 38 across. Um, when 20th century American sculptor, he's going to be one of the most famous sculptors in, in, in America, right? Alexander Blank dabbled in rug hooking design. His wife and neighbors created rare textiles, uh, textile, wait a minute, sorry, tech, uh, rare examples of his textile art. This is another example um, of a Coffee Time episode that was, I feel, fantastic. Because uh, this is not a story that everybody knows. This, of course, is Alexander Calder, C-A-L-D-E-R, 38 across, C-A-L-D-E-R. This is an interesting story because few things going on with Calder. All right, so this is Calder. Uh, he was from Connecticut. Right? I've seen lots of his art uh, locally. Um, it's somebody who I really love. I've actually built three-dimensional examples of some of his sculpture that I've used at the kids' birthday parties. Like, yeah, I mean, who does? Who has the time? I don't have the time for that anymore. This was before pre-rug hooking, P-R-H. Um, but this is an example of an Alder, Alexander Calder rug, but you have to be careful because you can see it says 1975. And I want to point out two examples of 1975 Alexander Calder rugs. It looks like echo hooking. This is not a hooked rug. This is a jute rug. It looks like standing wool close up, right? Because in 1975, there was this massive uh, earth, earthquake in Guatemala and there was like an artist's relief thing that was happening, like a live aid kind of a thing. Um, and a group of artists like decided to make art to raise funds to help the people. There's hundreds of people who died during this earthquake. Alexander Calder was one of them and he designed 14 rugs and tapestries that were then made by Guatemalan uh, weavers. This is one of them. This is not a hook drag, right? So this sold, this, this I think is currently for sale on first dip for $78,000. $78, so is this one, another Guatemala woven. This one I think you can see better. It looks like standing wool, but it's jute. Um, again, $78,000, 1975, because there's only 14 designs and they are numbered. This is number 75. There's not 14 rugs, there's 14 designs, but they are still extremely rare. He also has examples of needlepoint rugs. So while you might look at this and say, oh, maybe this is a hooked rug, it's a needlepoint rug. So we're getting warmer. Um, but yeah, not, still not a hooked rug. We will see hooked rugs and here we go. This is the article that got me going down the research trail. Um, so I included the article in this. This is an article from, gosh, it's got to be the, probably the 19, maybe the 1960s, talking about how he did dabble in rug design. And he would design something and his wife and the neighbors would make it for him. And there's not a lot of examples of these rugs out there. It's very hard to call. If they are not signed, this is one of them. I don't know. You have to watch back on the episode that I did because I might have said who LSR is. Um, and then I think C.A. is uh, maybe his wife. I'm not sure. One of them is his wife. Um, I'm pretty sure. But it's hard to call them because the thing with these Alexander Calder rugs was his wife was making them, the neighbors were ma making them, and then other people started making them that didn't have permission. And then it went a little haywire. And now in terms of provenance, it's very hard to call. Um, would be great as a crossword puzzle. Oh, I'll have to look back, Judy, and see which one that was. Which one was that? Was that one of the Marguerite Zorax? for a crossword puzzle I mean a jigsaw puzzle jigsaw puzzle so Alexander Calder look back on that episode too that was a fun that very fun episode to research and to run um, number 42 across this former chambermaid blank Johnson married up and became a wealthy wife and heiress who accumulated a vast collection of folk art including dozens of important hooked drugs and the answer you might remember this episode is Barbara and this is Barbara, right? She was the maid. Um, she married, um, um, I forget what his first name was, Johnson, something Johnson, but very, very, very wealthy man. And um, they were collectors together. 
and after he passed away, she continued to collect. This is her definitive book. This is another hard to find book. If you find it, you should grab it. Snake and Bird. Oh, Judy, that would be fantastic. Also as a needlepoint. Um, but yeah, as a jigsaw puzzle, it'd be fantastic. Um, this is, if you see this, you should grab it. And I've covered this on Coffee Time too, this book. It is absolutely fantastic. Huge collection of hook drugs. She was a really serious and very talented collector. She understood what was good and why it was good too. So let's move on to 43 Across. We paid tribute to this whimsical and colorful artist, Blank Smith, when she passed away in 2021. That was a very sad episode. That was a hard episode to run. I never met her, but man, that whole, I was choked up the whole time that I remember that night was hard. Some of her best known patterns are cone flowers, boating bunnies, and carrot cake. Let me show you those. So um, the answer is Sharon Smith. So here's Sharon Smith, so S-H-A-R-O-N, and some of her best known patterns are carrot cake, cone flowers, and Carmel cottages, as in California, Carmel. So beautiful. She remains one of my favorite, favorite rug hookers of all time. Her designs are available through Cushing. Wish I had them, but Cushing's got them. So number 44 across, in the early 20th century, Blank, this is a name, Blank Grenfell came to Labrador and Newfoundland, the Labrador and Newfoundland regions on a medical mission and ended up founding, sorry for the typo, ended up founding a rug hooking industry using silk stockings. And the answer is, oh no, I missed putting an image for this one. I'm sorry, I missed this one. Uh, I was gonna put, it's Grenfell rugs and the answer is Wilfred. W-I-L-F-R-E-D. Sorry, I was going to put a, um, I was going to put a Grenfell rug. Lots of episodes on Grenfell rugs too. But the answer is Wilfred. W-I-L-F-R-E-D. Number 45 across. This beloved Canadian colorist and designer, Doris Blank, last name, is well known for her famous edge finishing technique, right? And a million other things, a million other things. And the answer to that, I'm sure Canadians got this, is Doris. So this is Doris. Let me make it a little bit bigger. What a sweetheart, huh? She died uh, in September of 2019 at the age of 91. Um, she seems like she was such a sweet person. She has some videos. Doris Eaton, E-A-T-O-N, has some videos on YouTube, and they are fantastic videos. They're super helpful, including her, it's called the Eaton Finish, E-A-T-O-N, the Eaton Finish. Um, it's, her, it's her own invention. So just beautiful pictures of her. She seems like she was such a lovely person. This is a close-up of one of her. Oh, my heart just like hurt. Um, beautiful, beautiful rugs. That was from the cover. That's a cover uh, of this book. This is a very rare book, and it can be very expensive. If you find it, grab it. Thanks, Dawn. Um, Lifetime of Rug Hooking, Doris Eaton, right? And this piece is called Treetops and Fireflies. Um, this is a rare book. Right? This is a very hard one to find. Maybe not at this moment, but you, I've seen this book in the many hundreds, like 200, 300. And sometimes people buy it for that because it's super rare. Next question. This is a term. This is 46 across. This is a term for a dark background with slightly uneven, very dark background, with slightly uneven coloring that is meant to look faded and a little bit older than it is. And the answer is antique black. Right, so both of those words, antique black. Deborah says, I used her edging on my exchange mat gift. Oh, fantastic, Deborah. If you can, can you repost that in the group if you posted it already? I'd like to look at that close up and maybe just write, this is the Eaton finish. We talked about Doris Eaton on cocktail night. I would love to see that. I, I think I might've missed that. Um, so the answer is antique black. So for example, this is an antique rug, right? It's hard to show you antique black without showing you a piece of material, and I don't have one handy right now because I dye antique black all the time. Antique black is like mottled. It's not solid, right? It's light, it's dark, and sometimes it has whispers, little kisses of other colors like blues and purples, sometimes red, very, very faint, very, very faint, as if the color has kind of uh, decomposed or broken down over the many years, and it's not solid black anymore. That is called antique black. 47, very similar question. This is a term for a mizzy mozzy. Now that's a British term. A mizzy mozzy or hit or miss, that's an American term, background done in neutral colors. We use this phrase a lot uh, in rug hooking. And this is a good example of it. The answer is marble cake, 
We talk about this a lot with the Hutchinsons. They did a lot of marble cake. This is actually an image that I thought was the best image of marble cake that I saw in a hurry. This came from a website called Maine Seacoast Mission. And it's a beautiful antique hook drug with a marble cake background. You can see just why it's called that, right? Speeding along to number 48 across. This is a dyeing term for when you use a baseline color in all of your dye pots to give the wool a magical sameness. So in other words, you're using similar colors or the same color, right? A little bit in each dye pot, whether it's scraps or noodles, you're leaching other colors so that all of them come out the same because they have at least one of the same color in them. It's science. That's called when you marry your colors, marrying colors. So the answer is marry, M-A-R-R-Y. When you marry your colors, you are leaching or using the same dye over dyeing a lot of different colors. And they all have, whether it's very obvious or clear or not, they all have that color in them. And they do have this magical look to them like they go together because they have that thing in common. It's a real um, trick for dyers. It's a real trick. Moving down uh, to our last column, number 28 down, this symbol, popular on British rag rugs in the 19th century, was meant to ward off evil. Do you remember this from our episodes about rag rugs in Prati? The answer is a red diamond, a red diamond, believed to be in like, like uh, Northern England, um, Yorkshire mining um, communities. People knew about the red diamond and it was considered um, a superstitious symbol to ward off evil. This is a contemporary red diamond rug, a UK rug, um, from the fantastic website called Ragged Life. Ragged Life. Um, I'm trying to think of what her first name is. It's very British. She reviewed my book that's coming out in July. Um, she does all British forms like Prati, Pragi, same thing, um, Clippies, uh, very rag rug style, very historical style. She's fantastic. A Ragged Life. And the answer is Red Diamond. Oh, it's the one you, of course, it's the one you gave away, Deborah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Okay, moving on. We're going to run over a little bit. I'm sorry, my mouth runs. I'm sorry. I'll do less. Now I know I did 41 this time. That's too much. Maybe I'll do 30 or 32 next time. Uh, maybe I'll do 35 next time. Let me write 35 and let's shoot for that next time. Number 30 down, antique scarves, tablecloths, and piano shawls made of this fine early 19th century textile are now sought after items uh, in antique store finds for rug hooking. Very expensive too. Do you know what I'm talking, why do I keep clicking the one before it? I am so sorry. You know what I'm talking about? It's paisley, right? Paisley, very desirable for rug hookers. Very expensive, very expensive, but so worthwhile. And I'll tell you why. S huge part in, in history, right? Paisley is a textile. I'm not just talking about Jane Austen and her costume. Ma for Americans, massive, uh, serious status symbol and import, desirable import, right? If you could afford it, you really needed a Paisley shawl. So I, I, I took down some examples in painting of artists who have painted portraits of women. Alfred Stevens, I think he was Belgian, did a lot with Paisley shawls, a lot. Uh, so this is an Alfred Stevens painting of a Paisley shawl. This is a Robert Louis Reed version. You see this is way more um, loose, but you get that feel of the Paisley shawl. It is certainly a Paisley shawl, really beautiful. This is George Moran, beautiful painter, uh, more in the style of Seurat, like pointillism, right? Woman by the window with her Paisley shawl. Did not matter your age. It, what mattered was status. If you could afford it, you had to have it. Here comes another Alfred Stevens Paisley. He really is the master of Paisley. Um, beautiful, oversized shawl, right? You could This could be a tablecloth or a shawl. It was a really important part of history. It was, it was a huge moment in, in fashion um, history. This is a daguerreotype, right? I mean, I, I, I hate to think of how much this poor man had to spend for this shawl, but they obviously had the money for it. Um, is Paisley really a form of weaving? It, it is a woven, so yeah, it, it is. I don't know a lot about the history of Paisley, but it's definitely a woven. And it typically had an unfinished edge, like a fringe edge, not a handkerchief edge. Um, and that was part of the beauty of it. Sometimes it had a tassel edge, and I think all of these things affect the value. Also, the amount of black in it. Black was usually the background color, sometimes brown. This has very little black. 
right? So this one I think is currently on eBay for six hundred. Um, yeah, I think it is eBay. I think it's five ninety nine ninety nine. So this has so little black, you get all paisley, right? So this is a much more design. It's a whole conversation. I do have a book on paisley shawls. As soon as I get a chance, I want to read it and talk about the history of paisley shawls because we use paisley so much as rug hookers. I don't just want to do like an internet search. I want to dig in. But this will be a great conversation for us to have. We're almost there. Next question. Uh, 31 down. This rug hooking legend, Joan Blank, was a main designer, rug hooking designer, had a store in Kennebunkport, I'll add, uh, with a shop full of industry standard tools. Most of us have a hook or two of hers. Most of us have a lot of her hooks. She is Joan Moshimer. So M-O-S-H-I-M-E-R, Moshimer, right? So this is the whole sort of um, range of hooks. Cushing carries these hooks. I carry these hooks. Most rug hooking stores carry these hooks, right? It is like the industry standard. They are fairly short hooks, so make sure, like in terms that the stubbiness, the handle part is fairly short. Um, everybody likes different hooks, right? These are the ones I sell, so I hope you like them, but everybody likes different hooks. What was that gonna? Oh, I also wanted to show, and jo Joan Moshimer also wrote a classic book on rug hooking, and this is it. This is an easier one to find, very easy to find on eBay. It's a fantastic book. Um, called The Complete Book of Rug Hooking by Joan Moshimer. A lot of historic rugs in there, lots of technique. Next question, number 33 down. This color, named after a historic paint, um, a historic paint pigment, so this is a real paint pigment, right, uh, was originally made by grinding up a skeleton's bones, right? So in painting, this color was made originally by grinding up skeletons, seriously. And what is the answer? It is mummy brown. Cushing has carried mummy brown for, I would say, 100 years. I think probably it's one of the late 19th century original Cushing colors. Um, it is a beautiful brown. It doesn't look like any, I did it again. It doesn't look like anything else. It's a very warm brown. It's a very caramel brown. It has a hint of something else in it, right? It's one of these mystery colors. I said this to Lizanne when we were on the phone. Some of the cushion colors are like mystery colors. There, there isn't the equivalent in any other dye line. So answer for this, mummy brown, M-U-M-M-Y-B-R-O-W-N. Now here's an easy one, I think. This backing fabric is often confused because it has a doppelganger in the needlepoint world. This drives people crazy who are beginners because there is a rug hooking backing called monk's cloth and there is a needlepoint backing with no stretch called monk's cloth. And the needlepoint backing that is sold at all the big box stores is never going to work for us as rug hookers. So that is a pratfall that a lot of people take. It's such a bummer. The answer is monk's cloth, M-O-N-K-S-C-L-O-T-H. Number 35, we have four more answers. Pearl McGowan's lyrical, lyric, very lyrical and romantic 1949 book, The Blank Beneath Design, uh, is a romantic account of, her, of the origins of many of her patterns and historic patterns, right? And the answer is the dreams, right? So the answer is dreams, D-R-E-A-M-S. Uh, her book called The Dreams Beneath Design is my favorite of the Pro McGowan books. Good job, Linda. Um, it's a small book. It's her thinnest book. It's her first book. It is so beautiful. It goes into the history of a lot of the early rugs because she, starting in the 1920s, was finding, documenting, recording antique rugs, right? And they became the basis of many of her patterns. But she was a great historian. She went about, she set about collecting and documenting. That was an Un, um, unbelievable. Uh, you, you can't overstate the importance of this contribution to the craft, right? Her scholarship, her early legwork was amazing. Oh, it's not used for needlework. It's used for cross stitch, right? Counted cross stitch. Yep. Sorry, Judy. I always think of needlepoint as, as the same, but no, absolutely. It's counted cross stitch. Thank you. Judy, is Aida cloth the same, just cross stitch, not needlepoint? Just wondering. So the answer for this was dreams dreams. Uh, number 39 uh, down. This chilly main town, I gave you this answer earlier, has a winter custom, had a winter custom of hooking rugs with a highly three-dimensional sort of pile, um, three-dimensional flowers in place of fresh flowers for funerals in the winter, right? When you couldn't do fresh flowers, people would hook rugs that had a very high pile that looked like a bouquet or a wreath of flowers. The technique is now named after the town. 
So the town name is, and I know you know, it is, I can't believe I keep doing that, Waldeboro. W-A-L-D-O-B-O-R-O. Waldoboro. That sounded patronizing, sorry. Judy says, Aida is used for counted cross stitch, not needlepoint. Okay. Thank you, Judy. So this is a great example of uh, Waldoboro, right? Coming from the town of Waldoboro and that region, women learned how to hook this specific style. It is now known as Waldoboro. It is a form of rug hooking. Very densely hooked uh, pieces, then cut with scissors, right? Cut down and shaped like very high relief. This image came from a site called Lot Art, L-O-T-A-R-T. It is a new auction website. I think it's new. I've never seen it before. So interesting. Um, okay, two more, and I only have an image for one. This is the other one I screwed up a little bit, so I'm sorry about that. Antique Stealer Ralph Blank, that is the, uh, the, that's what you fill in, restored hooked rugs in the early 20th century and created replicas and records of very old patterns, which became the basis for his patterns. And I wrote in his three volumes on rug hooking, it's not him. I was thinking of Wild, William um, Winthrop Kent. So I'm sorry I said three volumes, but the rest of it is true, right? It is Ralph Burnham. He was an antique dealer in the early 20th century. And like Pearl McGowan, funny these two questions are side by side, um, he was a rug restorer. He had an antique business and one of the services was restoring rugs and he would get the rugs in and he would copy the patterns. And it sounds maybe a little unethical nowadays, but if he didn't, we would have lost all those patterns. And then he put out rug hooking catalogs and those patterns were in them. So the answer is Burnham, B-U-R-N-H-M-A-N. No, I'm sorry, Burnham, B-U-R-N-H-M-A-N. N-H-A-M. Is that what I said? Burnham. Burnham. Ralph Burnham. Last one. 41 down. This fabulous, one of my great buddies, this fabulous busy rug hooker is the author of many landmark books, including Hooking with Yarn, um, Save That Rug. Uh, she also manages the blog site, I Hope That You Belong, Rug Hooking Daily. And she has her own business, which is called Little House Rugs. She also has the great Facebook group that we go to all the time called Repairing Hooked Rugs. And the answer, of course, is Judy Taylor. Judy Taylor with a Y. Judy with a Y. So we have covered, I think, here's Judy Taylor. What a sweetheart. We have covered, um, I hope, all of Judy's books or most of Judy's books. T-shirt treasures we have. This is a fantastic book. These are all available on her website. Um, Little House Rugs, right? All of her books are there. So this is T-shirt treasures. This is um, m m m Save That Rug, right? How this is the this is the ultimate repair guide in my mind. Also the Facebook page, right? Also Repairing Hooked Rugs, her Facebook page. Uh, Breaking the Boundaries. I know we covered this. The Artistry of Sharon Johnston. This was an amazing book. Uh, she's got more books than I'm showing you here. The New Joy of Rug of Hooking with Yarn, right? She has got a ton of books. They are fabulous how many how many did you get right did you get a lot of them right did anybody get all of them right another great group yeah repairing hook drugs is a great uh, facebook group anything that judy does is great she's a great moderator she's kind she's forthcoming with information um she's fun she's approachable she's knowledgeable it's like what more can you want you know she's got she is just the ultimate ultimate um, she's one of these people who gives more than they take in this business. Uh, and those are the people who I like to be around, right? Because I think if, you, if you're not doing that, you're doing it wrong. Um, two, well, Judy, that's great. That's great because you're, you work more with a needle and you're, we're learning as we go. I think that's fantastic. Um, I would think it would be incredible if anybody got all of them, right? These, these span like many years of conversations for us. And I will look forward to working on the next one. I'm going to shoot for 35 next time. I think that might be the magic number. So we can still fool around, but um, we don't go till 9.09. 17, right? That's impressive. Well, that's okay if you look them up. That was work too, right? That was work too. You did great. You all did great. I know you all did great. It was a fun episode. It was a fun episode for me too. Thank you so much for playing along. Uh, lots of fun. So we'll work on another one. We'll do that on a regular basis. I really enjoyed it. 
I really, I really enjoyed it. So just a reminder, I'm teaching in person on Sunday at Madison Wool, Hooking with Quilt Fabric, and I'm teaching in the PM on Zoom online, uh, Color and Composition. So if you like these kinds of conversations about art, about uh, why things look right, why things don't, why things look different, not wrong, but different, this will be a great class for you. Whether you're a designer or not, it's just fun to have these conversations and to know what we're looking at, right? I went to college many times for art. This is all uh, in the back of my head all the time, and it helps me a lot, whether I'm filling in someone else's pattern, designing something new, or just standing in a museum looking at something, you know? So I hope to see you this weekend for classes. Um, I'm going to post, I'm, I'm not going to be on early next week because I'm going to Vermont. So while I'm sure that I will be um, doing some live shows, make sure that you are subscribing to the YouTube channel because I'm going to be with my friend um, and, and buddy who works with me at Ribbon Candy Hooking. She is the moderator of our Facebook group, Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club, Club and a designer, Kirsten Gay. We're going to be together in Vermont uh, with our families uh, celebrating the 4th of July and I'm sure we're going to come live to you. So I'm sure we're going to be talking and coming live to you, but we won't be running a regular show on Monday or Wednesday. I will make it up to you, I promise. I'm certainly going to come to you uh, with daily clips, right? I'll definitely be doing daily clips like I have been on YouTube, on Facebook, and I will certainly be with you on Thursday and Friday. So for something, I hope on Thursday because I'm traveling home. Be looking out on our Facebook group and also be looking on the YouTube channel, Ribbon Candy Hooking, for our schedule. So I am on the move, but I will be doing a lot of content while I'm gone. And I won't be doing another formula show like this until next Friday night, when my hope is that I'm still invited over at to Naomi Campbell's house. She is Ravensgate Primitives. That is her brand. I'd like to go over there and fool around with her and have some cocktails next Friday night. And she invited me. Do you remember? She did invite me. Uh, so I'm hoping that that still works out. Regardless, I will see you next week. I hope I see you over the weekend in a class situation. And in the meantime, happy, um, did you say Independence Day tomorrow in Canada? It's Independence Day for Canadians tomorrow, right? Um, and happy 4th to you all. Um, and let's link up and you will see my face, but I will see you for a show next Friday. So if I come up with anything in between, be looking out because it could work. I just can't say for sure. Uh, safe travels. Happy holiday. Um, she's a grand old flag. So I, I'll keep my patriotism at bay. I think I probably will record a crazy patriotic song um, on the 4th of July. And, and tomorrow, happy celebrating for Canadians as well. I think, I think it's tomorrow, right? Uh, happy weekend, everybody. I will see you soon. Be looking out for ribbon candy hooking announcements. Um, and again, happy holidays, whether you are Canadian. For those of you who are neither Canadian nor American, I will just see you next week. And I'm sorry for the absence. But Canada Day. Thank you. Canada Day. Um, I will see you all soon. Have a happy weekend. Great celebration.